This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to The Perfect Run. Chapter 61, Death Warrant. It was May 12th, and Team Quick Save the Pandas had assembled. As he drove towards Rust Town, Ryan hoped this battle would go better than Vulcan's doomed assault against the metagang. The time traveler had gathered everyone he could call upon, provided all the necessary intel, and he wore a cashmere suit. Everyone would soon move into position, Shorty included. The die was cast. Adam Cat remained silent at the car's front seat, having outfitted his costume with a dark bandolier. Ryan thought knives were classic for a reason, but the idea of someone getting beaten by explosive darts amused him to no end. The in wardrobe stayed at the back, the former whispering a song to himself, and the latter examining Ryan with her big, beautiful eyes. Yuki, I know you designed my new mask, Ryan said, but this is getting a little creepy. You went on a date yesterday, wardrobe said with a smile. I can feel it. Did she have a gossip radar or something? Then again, Ryan had returned to his penthouse suspiciously late into the night. In the end, the ten-minute visit lasted half an hour. Lucky Girl had incredible taste, both for interior decoration and her sculpture hobby, to the point the courier would introduce her to wardrobe. He had the feeling they would get along fantastically well. However, while Ryan had enjoyed the date, his master plan had utterly failed. Lucky Girl just sent him a message saying she would allow him to invite her again. It was nothing serious, Yuki, said the courier, so I'm still open to new romantic applications. Sorry, I really like you Ryan, but I'm already in an exclusive contract with someone else. Really? Congratulations, the time traveler replied with a warm smile. That's wonderful. Thanks, she's super nice, you will love her, Yuki said with a grin. But we're talking about your love life. Is she an I.L. Miglior? Is it Len? I will leave you to your endless speculations, watching as you go down the rabbit hoe, wardrobe's costume instantly transformed into a cosplay of Sherlock Holmes, hat and pipe included. Hey, that's cheating. Hmm, wardrobe observed Ryan, making deductions in her mind. If I had to make an elaborate guess. I would say Adam Cat's sister Fortuna, and it didn't go farther than a chaste kiss. Adam Cat emerged from his silent reverie to look at Ryan in disbelief. What? he asked. That's awesome Yuki, the congratulated wardrobe. How did you figure it out? Elementary, my dear panda. You know Sherlock Holmes and never said that in the Conan Doyle novels? Ryan complained, but wardrobe ignored him. We know she was pestering him for a date, and from his expression, he clearly considered it a chore before being pleasantly surprised, Yuki explained, her mannerism mimicking Sherlock Holmes' most famous movie adaptations. Hence, he accepted out of a sense of obligation, perhaps hoping to subtly discourage her. His hairstyle is also well-groomed and his smell remains the same. Thus, we can assume the absence of physical intimacy. I hate yellow genomes, Ryan said glowering while ignoring Adam Cat's baleful glare. I hate them so much. Also, why didn't you use this costume before? You could have cracked the whole conspiracy in minutes. I don't like this costume, wardrobe replied, changing back to her normal clothes. If I wear it for too long, I develop a craving for cocaine, tobacco, and violins. That's not good for my health. Ryan, I warned you, Felix said, infuriated. I asked you man to man, friend to friend. The courier looked into his second favorite cat's eyes, and decided to tease him some more. I just want us to become family, kitten, the courier said softly. Is that so much to ask? Instead of turning red as Ryan had hoped, Felix answered with a fiendish smile. Ryan, your adoptive sister, he spoke with the same teasing tone as the courier, she's single, isn't she? When Felix struck back, he hit hard. I see the kitten is young, but he has claws. I'm just saying, we could become a family, quickie. But if you take, you have to give back too. That's great. Wardrobe said, finding twisted joy in the scene. You marry each other's sister, and then your kids will have a teen romance. I can see the drama. Ryan looked back at the road. You discovered my only weakness, kitten. You are a troll worthy of respect. Thank you, now drive, Felix replied. 
If the meta don't kick your ass today, I'll do it myself afterward. Oh, we're going to Rust Town. Wardrobe asked with a frown. I had the feeling we would go there, but Enrique refused to tell us until we arrived. I guess now the cat is out of the bag, we could check our intel, Ryan said, Felix rolling his eyes. This reminded the courier that he should sneak into Jasmine's foundry and recover Eugene Henry after the raid. Felix brought out his phone, having recorded files on it. Adam Fontaine, alias Adam the Ogre, alias the Brooklyn Cannibal, Adam Cat read the report while showing wardrobe and the a picture of Hanifat Lecter. The USA issued an international arrest warrant after he was suspected of murdering four people in Brooklyn, but he escaped to Europe on the Genome Wars Eve. Wait, he was a cannibalistic serial killer before getting his elixirs? Ryan asked. Every time he thought Hanifat couldn't get worse, he was proven wrong. Yeah, Adam was a psycho long before he went psycho. Orange slash violet. He can turn his skin into a highly resistant carbon alloy, granting him enhanced strength and tank-like resilience, additionally, his stomach has been turned into a pocket dimension where he can store almost anything. Felix paused briefly. Huh, he has almost the same power as dad, though way weaker. Mars has an armory dimension, right? Wardrobe asked. I really like his war god costume. Very classy. Except unlike Adam, he has a large range, Felix said gruffly, before quickly changing the subject. This time, he read them the report on Adam's bodyguard. Frank the Mad, identity unknown. Suffers from schizophrenic delusions where he identifies as a World War II commando, Vietnam veteran, US Secret Service agent, and an Area 51 super soldier experiment. However, his testimonies contradict real events, and he becomes aggressive if called out on the inconsistencies. Orange slash red, his body is made of metal and can consume more to grow in size, also absorbs kinetic energy. Ryan frowned. He can only consume metal? Not stone or ivory? Only metal, Felix replied, a little confused by the question. Why? Because of how Frank's power had reacted to Augustus. Ryan had heard the rumors that Augustus' body was in temporal stasis, which sounded plausible since he could act in the courier's frozen time. However, then he shouldn't age and a tumor wouldn't threaten his life. As for the other possible colors, if Augustus was a white genome, then his invulnerability should react differently to powers and normal attacks. Yet it didn't. The courier remembered the end of his disastrous Augusti run. Frank the Mad and Augustus had briefly traded blows, and the psycho's power had automatically reacted. It tried to absorb lightning but, though it failed. The fact Frank's power reacted at all meant Augustus' body was made of something that registered as metal, albeit one the psycho couldn't consume easily. This excluded the spatial stasis hypothesis. But then, how could it explain the immunity to the time stop, and well, everything? Perhaps lightning but had consumed a yellow elixir turning him into a Roman deity metal statue? Yellow or orange, Ryan thought. The courier had the feeling he had all the pieces of the puzzle, but he needed to assemble them the right way. He barely listened to the conversation afterward, though much to his amusement, he learned that Psyshock's real name was Francis Gray of all things. The group passed the private security checkpoint without trouble, either they were the first heroes on the scene, or a few patrols had been warned to let them through. Instead of driving straight to the junkyard though, Ryan drove to the north of Rust Town and its industrial district. The plan called for Dynamis to surround the metagang from all sides, and knowing PSYPSY, he must have taken the courier's prank personally. Better to lure the psychos to an unpopulated area. Raid should start in 30 minutes, Adam Cat said while checking the time. Rust Town was eerily silent as they drove, the air suffused with tension. Either Psyshock had already brainwashed the locals, or they could sense a fight would start soon and stayed home. Old neon lights flickered dangerously as the sun rose in the skies. No, Ryan realized, a sun. Leo Hargraves traveled through the skies like a missile, aiming straight for the junkyard at a fighter jet speed. By then, the courier had reached an abandoned gas station north of the area, vast swathes of concrete covered in oil stains. The place looked like a graveyard, facing a series of abandoned projects and crumbling industrial buildings. A figure stood on one's roof, hands pointed at the Plymouth Fury. 
Saren. A second after Ryan noticed her, she unleashed a blast of concussed air straight at the car. It's time, boys and girls, the driver whistled as his car swerved to avoid Miss Chernobyl's blast. The attack hit the concrete pavement and blasted it to bits, while Ryan kept his car on the move. Almost immediately, a pack of customized Dynamis dog drones broke through the building's doors, having waited in ambush for the group. Panda! Ryan shouted, as his team prepared for battle. Show them your training. Yes, Sifu. The young apprentice opened his door and jumped out of the car, having fully shape-shifted before he hit the road. His bestial form tackled the drones, while Saren kept bombarding the car from her sniping point. By now, Hargraves had hit the junkyard like a cruise missile, but he was only the vanguard. A swarm of helicopters flew above Rust Town from the west, led by Alphonse Manada's own vehicle. Wyvern, Devilry, and other flyers followed in their wake. The metagang's response was swift and brutal. Missiles surged from the junkyard and demolished some of the helicopters, probably the doing of Saishok's mech. Immediately afterward, tremors shook all of Rust Town, before turning into a full-blown quake. The weakest buildings collapsed under the strain, forcing Saren to fly away from her current position. Acidic clouds spread across the skies, threatening to engulf the entire district. The battle for Rust Town had begun. Now that he didn't have to dodge Saren's blasts, Ryan abruptly stopped the car near the gas station. He and his remaining teammates quickly stepped out of it, the whole place smelling of gasoline. With a whistle from the courier, the Plymouth Fury's autopilot took over and drove it to safety. Now, Ryan said, as he brought his coil gun and Desert Eagle out of his suit, wielding one in each hand, who goes first? Me, me. Wardrobe suit changed into a cosplay of Frankenstein's monster. Lightning surged through her body, allowing her to move at an impressive speed. She powered through a hail of gunfire from a Dynami's drone and smashed it to paste with her bare hands. Less cheerful, Adam Cat grabbed darts and threw them at Saren. Hazmat Girl blasted them mid-flight, causing the projectiles to violently detonate and throw her back against a crumbling building. Ryan opened fire on her trying to open a few holes in her suit. However, as acidic raindrops fell from the heavens above, Ryan realized he had a date of his own. A feeling of dread went down his spine, as he pointed his coil gun behind him and pressed the trigger. Acid rain had teleported behind him, knives in hands, but had to duck out of the way to dodge the courier's own projectile. The coil gun's bullet grazed her cheek and narrowly missed her head, a drop of blood falling on the ground. You thief, she snarled angrily, raising her weapons threateningly. You bar the gates. You always try to stab me in the back when we meet, Ryan taunted her, having grown almost accustomed to it. You don't have to be so shy. I'll carve you open, back and front. Acid rain snarled as she threw a knife at his head with deadly accuracy. While the courier dodged, Adam Cat attempted to grab the psycho and blow her into nothingness, but she quickly teleported away before he could close the gap. Saren jumped from her observation point and landed on the street, opening fire at Ryan and Adam Cat. The courier quickly stopped time, grabbed his kitten, and moved them out of the way. Hazmat Girl's blast hit the gas station and detonated whatever was left of the gasoline within in a fiery detonation. The blast tossed Ryan and Adam Cat onto their chests on the ground, while the in-wardrobe were too busy with the drones to assist them. Saren prepared to fire another blast, only for an invisible blade to behead her. Her hazmat suit collapsed while rusting gas escaped its confines, and shields of glass formed above the various heroes to protect them from the acid raindrops. This gave Ryan and Felix precious time to rise back up. We have to kill Acid Rain, Shroud warned as he appeared next to Ryan, acid raindrops turning him visible. Soon, the rain threatened to transform into a downpour. Her power will kill thousands. Left. Ryan shouted a warning as he sensed Acid Rain's power activate. The Psycho teleported back into sight, two submachine guns in hand. She unleashed a hail of gunfire at Shroud and his companions, the carnival member raising a multi-layered barrier of glass to protect the group. Open the gates, you thief. Acid Rain snarled with a maddened face, her projectiles unable to force their way through the barrier. You won't keep that place away from me. When she ran out of bullets, 
Shroud reshaped his defense into a volley of deadly shards, while Ryan assisted him with bullets and Adam Cat with explosive darts. Acid Rain tossed the machine guns away and teleported away before any projectile could hit her. The more he observed her lightning speed in action, the more Ryan grew convinced her teleportation ability came with enhanced spatial awareness, the same way his own power provided an enhanced sense of timing. Explosions shook Rust Town, and Ryan noticed flashes of crimson light coming from the junkyard. Frank the Mad came into view, now the size of a 10 meters tall giant and smashing a transformed wyvern through whatever buildings hadn't yet collapsed after the quake. Kaiju Battle Ryan would have fanboyed, if his entire team's life wasn't on the line. A shiver went down his spine, as he sensed acid rain teleport all around them at blinding speed. In the blink of an eye, Shroud, Ryan, and Adam Cat found themselves surrounded by falling grenades. Shit. Ryan froze time to save his allies, grabbing as many grenades as he could and tossing them away before they could explode. But 10 seconds were far too few, and while he could spare Felix and himself the worst of the bombardment, two grenades exploded right next to Shroud. The detonation blew the glass manipulator's right arm off and shattered his armor, sending him crashing to the ground. Immediately, his control of the glass shards faltered and the hero's rain shields collapsed into dust. Ryan sensed acid raindrops eat at his cashmere suit, much to his chagrin. Worse, acid rain exploited the cooldown to appear right in front of Felix and stab him in the chest with two knives by surprise. The young man collapsed to his back, two knives still embedded in his body. Though he thought he had grown numb to these things, Ryan panicked. Felix. Matthias. I'm on it. Wardrobe broke away from her fight with the drones, leaving the to manage them, and rushed at the wounded. Right. Ryan shouted a warning, acid rain teleporting right next to Wardrobe with a gun in hand. Thankfully, Yuki's costume changed into a ghost bedsheet before the teleporter pressed the trigger, the bullet phasing harmlessly through her head. He had to distract that bastard. I'm the one you want, Blondie. Ryan challenged Acid Rain, though she teleported out of his bullet's path. I'm leaving for the purple world and stranding you here. The taunt worked, Acid Rain reappearing in front of him and opening fire with her gun. You selfish punk, you think you can keep it all for yourself? Ryan froze time to dodge, before engaging the psycho in a gunfire version of whack-a-mole. The had smashed the last drone with his bare paws, while Wardrobe had changed her outfit to that of a nurse, dragging the wounded away from the battlefield. She's too fast, Ryan thought, as he frantically attempted to hit acid rain and failed every time. And unlike lightning but, his projectiles couldn't change direction mid-flight. He could have brought Polly's facehugger missile, but decided against it. Such a weapon was safe to use when the courier fought the meta solo, but with teammates? The risk of the psycho purposefully leading the projectile towards an ally was too great to ignore. This may have been a miscalculation. Thankfully, Acid Rain ran out of projectiles before he did. In the blink of an eye, she disappeared and reappeared to his left, nearly beheading Ryan with a katana. The ultimate one favors me, she snarled, forcing the courier to back down to avoid a strike. She didn't give him any time to aim, or even think of a joke. It wants me to win. Sifu, I'm coming. The attempted to flank Acid Rain and save his master, paws raised. Panda roll. With inhuman speed, Acid Rain dodged the attack and raised her blade to behead the slower animal. Realizing the danger, Ryan abruptly stopped time to force her to disappear, but the second time resumed, the psycho eviscerated the by surprise, spilling his bowels all over the ground. However, this gave Ryan a brief time window to aim, and he managed to hit Acid Rain in the stomach with the Desert Eagle. The Psycho vanished before she could collapse, but some blood droplets remained behind. Sifu, the gasped, a hand on his stomach while his bowels spilled all over the pavement. Young Apprentice. Unfortunately, before he could even reach the Acid Rain teleported above Ryan and struck him in the head with a steel pipe. The courier's world briefly blurred and he dropped his guns, only to get hit in the chest before he could recover his breath. Once you're dead, I can finally go back. Acid Rain started pummeling him with two steel pipes, one in each hand. She had no style and no skill whatsoever, she didn't need them. 
She was pure savagery and speed. Even Ryan's enhanced sense of timing struggled to keep up the pace, and the acidic raindrops had started burning the skin below his costume. I can go all the way back. You think you can keep my family away from me? You're killing me. But while the courier couldn't match her in human speed or strength, he more than dwarfed her in sheer skill. Using a boxing move, Ryan sucker punched acid rain in the stomach, right where his bullet had hit. The psycho let out a scream of pain, but the courier kept pummeling this weak point, blood tainting her white shirt. She lost her breath, and dropped one of the steel pipes on the ground. Sifu. Acid Rain looked at her left, as the flanked her. He had shape-shifted back into a human, and as Dr. Tirano guessed, it had fully healed him. The lunged at a distracted Acid Rain, fist raised, and shape-shifted in the middle of his attack. Instead of a human punch, the psycho took a full bare paw to the chest, some ribs breaking with a sickening crack. The blow tossed her backward like a ragdoll, but she teleported away before hitting the pavement. Ryan sensed her teleport again above the a knife in hand. She fell upon the beast like a guillotine, but the courier grabbed her wrist before she could hit him and tossed her to the ground with a judo move. She teleported away again, trying to stab Ryan from the left. This time, slowed down by her wounds, he managed to avoid Acid Rain's stab and punched her in the face. The more I get into a situation, the better at it I become. And now, Ryan grabbed the steel pipe on the ground. I got the hang of you, Rain Woman. Illustrating his words with action, Ryan hit her in the face, sending teeth flying. The psycho took a few steps back, while the and his master flanked her from both sides. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Acid Rain panted in exhaustion, searching inside her pocket with a hand and raising her knife at the duo with the other. Blood flowed from her chest and mouth, her wounds taking their toll on her. I, send me, send me there. She raised a grenade at the heroes. Send me there, the psycho snarled, threatening to detonate the bomb. Send me there, you son of Dash. Boom. Before Ryan knew what happened, Acid Rain collapsed to the side, blood flowing from the back of her skull. A shadow had risen behind her, a rifle in hand. Good grief, poor old Mortimer thought she would never stop teleporting around, Mortimer said, as he reloaded his rifle. You alright, kid? Sifu, who is this guy, the asked, a little shocked by the assassin's surprise appearance. He, he looks like a supervillain. Because he is one, Ryan said, while glancing down at Acid Rain's corpse. Considering the downpour started to dissipate, she wouldn't get back up. You should stop doing that, it's almost vexing. Lady Death's got no owner, Corpo, only dealers, Mortimer replied with a shrug. Anyway, you should check on your friends. I think your nurse dragged them behind a pile of concrete. Just to be sure, you aren't going to fight us? Ryan asked. Since Sunshine had made a very public appearance, the courier worried Augustus had sent the Killer Seven to attack the carnival and everyone present. Then again, the assassin wouldn't have helped in that case. What? No, Fortuna would whine like a baby if poor old Mortimer did that. By the way, you have all my respect for not having strangled her yet. I admire your self-control. Then why are you here, my kill-stealing friend? Mortimer snorted, before sinking into the pavement. Miss Livia sends her regards. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to the perfect run. Chapter 62, Quest Complete. I'm losing him. Wardrobe panicked. It didn't take long for Ryan and the to locate their allies, who had turned the rubble of a collapsed building into a shelter. Cosplaying as a masked surgeon, Wardrobe had raised an improvised hospital tent from whatever material she could find. She had managed to stitch up Adam Cat's stab wounds the best she could, but Felix remained in a state of shock. Shroud, meanwhile, was losing blood at an alarming rate in spite of her best efforts. Acid Rain's grenade had not only blown off his right arm, but impaled his thigh with shrapnel. Can't you do CPR? The asked a stupid question. CPR can do almost anything, Yuki replied, but not give someone their blood back. But there has to be something you can do, the panicked. You could turn into Christ. I can't solve every problem by cosplaying as Jesus. Wardrobe protested, 
quickly losing her nerve as her efforts failed. Who can heal any wounds? I can't think of the right persona. I think I can help, Ryan said while searching inside his suit for a knife and wires, to perform improvised surgery. However, even an optimist like him thought saving Shroud would be a long shot. The vigilante had lost an incredible amount of blood, if he wasn't a genome, he would have perished already. The courier blamed himself for this mess. Ryan was used to fighting alone with no regard for collateral damage, he didn't do so well in a team, where he had to avoid friendly fire. The courier should have trained with his team before the battle, learned to coordinate better with the group. Right before Ryan could start a last chance surgery, he sensed an odd feeling down his spine, for a second, he thought Acid Rain had survived the headshot, only for a violet tear in space to open near the group. The carnival teleporter ace and someone dressed as a plague doctor stepped through, immediately flinching at their wounded teammate's sight. Move away, the plague doctor ordered, whom Ryan identified as the carnival member Dr. Stitch. He opened a black bag he carried around his waist, to reveal an assortment of tools and strange organic devices. He quickly grabbed one of them, a horrifying white tumor with tendrils sticking out. Why do you carry that on yourself? The asked, resisting the urge to vomit. My expertise is in viruses and bacterias, Stitch replied, the tumor wriggling within his fingers. He quickly applied it to Shroud's wound, the tumor grafting itself to the vigilante's flesh. My bacteria colony will help repair. No time for mad science exposition, Ace cut in, before focusing on Ryan and the U2 report. Saren has been blown away, and Acid Rain's skull blown out, Ryan said. He couldn't resist making terrible jokes when stressed. Good, Wyvern and Devilry are handling Frank for now, so we can assume the perimeter is secured, the teleporter said with a nod, while Stitch and Wardrobe cooperated to save Shroud. You can still fight, right? Then you come with me. Stitch and Wardrobe will go to the infirmary and treat the wounded. We should take Wardrobe, Ryan protested. I mean, Walleye is as big as a whale, and Yuki's Japanese. She's his natural predator. Ace seemed somewhat amused by his joke, but remained serious. We have many fighters, but not enough people to treat the wounded. How are things going? The courier asked, while Ace opened a portal towards what looked like a Dynami's hospital camp. Wardrobe and Stitch quickly dragged the wounded through the rift. Worse than expected, but still good, the teleporter replied, closing the portal and opening another. Leo and Mr. Wave blew up the Meta's mech, but Adam barricaded himself inside his underground base. We're fighting his remaining men door to door, and Psyshock is throwing brainwashed suicide bombers at us. As Ryan had expected, failing to kill the brainjacker caused casualties to increase exponentially. Most importantly, he could read between the lines. Sunshine couldn't destroy Mechran's base without killing the metagang's hostages, and now, they had to clean the bunker up with an old-fashioned assault. Which meant Dynamis had learned of its existence. If the enormous casualties wouldn't force Ryan to restart, this change would. Though they had provided valuable help during this loop, the courier didn't trust Dynamis with Mechran's technology. Too many corrupt elements in their ranks. Ace opened a new portal, Ryan and the passing through. In the blink of an eye, they left the toxic open atmosphere of Rust Town for the suffocating claustrophobia of Mechran's bunker. Ryan didn't recognize the room, some kind of industrial warehouse with metal arms and cables dangling from the ceiling. Assembly lines dedicated to robot manufacturing had been repurposed into improvised barricades, the air smelled of ozone, and ominous red lights pulsed from the ceiling. The corpses of both psychos and normal humans lay on the ground, torn apart by heavy weaponry. Fallout and armored members of the private security had formed a line, bombarding the metagang's barricades. To Ryan's surprise, none of their enemies were mutated, they were all dog drones, brainwashed technicians, and enslaved denizens of Rust Town. Most of them carried Dynamis made firearms, but a few wielded strange weapons with Mechran's logo on them. Most nightmarishly, all of them wore suicide belts, and the metagang had tied up people to their barricades. Not only did Psyshock throw brainwashed slaves at Dynamis, he dared use his few remaining sane prisoners as human shields. I'm just saying, that's why I'm against automation, a private security member in power armor declared, as he blasted a hound drone with a laser minigun. 
First they steal our jobs, and then they try to steal our lives. Yeah, and I'm paid 3,000 a month when these things cost a quarter of a million to make, another guard added, using a flamethrower to torch Saishok's brainwashed cannon fodder. That's the real economic inequality. Shut up and keep fighting, Alphonse grunted, raising a hand at a technician threatening him with a rocket launcher. His metal fingers shone with nuclear energy, before blasting the attacker apart with a gamma ray. While the smashed through a barricade with a roar and Ace fled through another portal, Ryan approached Dynami's VP. How are things going, atomic cancer? The brainwashed thralls blow themselves up if we approach them, and they use their free-willed captives as shields, Alphonse grunted, completely ignoring Ryan's nickname for him. Disgusting. We have to take down Psyshock. Ryan turned around, noticing Enrique Manada behind them. The corpo kept one knee against the ground, surrounded by thin, nearly undetectable vines spreading through the bunker's corridors. He is the backbone of their defense. If he falls, the rest will follow. Green hand? Ryan asked, quickly lowering his head to dodge a stray bullet. You're here too. Surprised, Romano, the grass manipulator replied dryly, fingers on the vines. Unlike Ryan's, the corpo's cashmere suit remained fully intact. I thought you were more of a pencil pusher, bravely commanding from the rear. You thought wrong. Enrique turned to face his brother. Al, I've located Adam and Saishok. Second room to the right. I suspect it is the base's command center. This worried Ryan greatly. If the meta already managed to access the bunker's mainframe, it meant they might access the Bahamut. Knowing Big Fat Adam, he would press the trigger as soon as he could. I will carve a straight path, Alphonse said, his metal hands shining with radioactive energy. Brother, you guide us. Quick save, cover our rear. Does anybody have a spare gun? Ryan asked, having lost his own during the fight with acid rain. Take mine, Enrique said, searching inside his suit and tossing a Beretta at Ryan. The courier claimed it as his own, though with a clear lack of enthusiasm. What, Romano? Not good enough for you. I'm disappointed it's not gold-plated. You have strange stereotypes about my social position, Romano. Enough prattle, Alphonse said, before putting his hands against the right wall. The heat increased as he channeled energy through the metal, melting it away. Within seconds, Fallout had shaped a hole big enough to allow the trio to progress. After a few minutes of improvised digging, the group melted their way into a large room shielded by a colossal blast door. As Enrique had guessed, the area looked like the bunker's central mainframe, large screens covered the walls, while ten colossal server towers served as pillars holding up the ceiling. A single blast door served as the entrance, red lights flickering as tremors shook the complex. The most noteworthy part of the area, though, was the gargantuan biomechanical construct at the center. The machine, easily the size of an elephant, reminded Ryan of a human brain, albeit completely blue and outfitted with thick wires, alien implants, and electrical pylons protruding outward from the cerebrum. A mass of nerve-like wires connected the structure to a metal pedestal supporting the biomechanical brain, while a crimson force field shielded it from the outside world. Psyshock had intermingled with the machine like a blood-sucking flea, his tendrils intertwining with the nerves. Hanifat Lecter stood in front of the force field, his skin covered in an alloy carbon and his eyes glancing at the screens above. You know, Psyshock, I think it's time to go Old Testament on them, Hanifat Lecter ordered his second in command, as he watched Dynami's forces break past their defenses on the screens. Bomb Sodom and Gamara back to the Stone Age. I can't, I need more time to crack the firewalls, Psyshock froze, as he and his commander noticed the newcomers. His cold voice turned furious when he saw Ryan. Little Chesare, you and your sister ruined everything. Thanks, Ryan said, pointing a gun at the brainjacker while Alphonse raised his hands at Adam. It's always a pleasure. Fontaine, Gray, time to surrender. Even with all the chaos happening around them, Blackthorn remained icily polite. Release the hostages, you're surrounded. There is no escape. Perhaps, Big Fat Adam replied with a false smile, before revealing an item hidden behind his back, but I got one last trick up my sleeve. A bottle full of a black, 
swirling liquid, with Mekron symbol stamped on some kind of colored glass. An elixir, as black as a starless night. A Mekron made elixir. You know what they say. Adam said, raising the bottle and preparing to throw it at the group like a psycho-making grenade. If you can't beat them, join them. Ryan froze time, calmly raised his gun, and shot the bottle while it was still in Adam's hand. Much to his shock, the liquid moved in the stop time. Like a living blob of black oil, it surrounded the ogre's fingers, melting the carbon armor and seeping through his skin. When the clock struck again, big fat Adam let out a scream of pain, as the ooze swallowed his arm and progressed through his body. Sir. Saishak shouted in alarm, as the black elixir slowly covered all of its host's body like a mantle of darkness. Fallout immediately unleashed a blast of energy at the mutating Psycho with enough power to vaporize him. Adam raised his blackened hand, and an invisible force cancelled the atomic ray. It simply stopped existing past a certain point. Hanifat Lecter wished he had died though. His screams turned deafening, as the black elixir melted his skin and flesh, leaving only blackened bones and organs. The Psycho's body couldn't assimilate the black elixir, and it devoured him alive. What is this sorcery, Blackthorn muttered to himself, horrified by the sight. Meanwhile, his more ruthless elder brother increased the output of his blasts, to no avail, the black elixir's power trumped his own. Adam's skeleton shambled, the black ooze manipulating the bones like a puppet. The undead's body degraded at an accelerated pace, organs dissolving, and yet it could still form words. You, you, open, the voice didn't belong to Adam. You, the corpse raised a melted finger at an astonished Ryan, black ooze leaking from the emptied eye sockets. Blackthorn quickly forced the courier behind him, as if to shield him. Ah, he cared. You, you, must open. Adam was no longer in control. The elixir was. Open, the gate, send me, send me, to the black, it is, the voice turned from pleading to agonizing, as Adam's jaw and throat started to dissolve. This dimension, is not, send me, back. Afterward, even Hanifat Lecter's enhanced body could no longer resist the degradation. The words turned incomprehensible, as the corpse collapsed into a puddle of black oil, having consumed its own host, the sinister substance dissipated into nothingness. Of the metagang's leader, not even dust remained. Well, it was one hell of a slimming cure. Ryan joked, trying to lighten the atmosphere. After a brief moment of silence, Fallout attacked Psyshock next. One of his nuclear rays hit the force field, unleashing a pulse of energy that shorted out half the screens. Yet the defensive barrier held. In response, parts of the ceiling opened to reveal automated Gatling turrets, all of them opening fire on the group. Ryan briefly stopped time and pushed Enrique out of the firing line, sparing him a volley of bullets to the face. Fallout's armor shrugged off the projectiles, while Dynami's VP increased his power's output, he unleashed a sustained ray of focused nuclear energy at the force field, until Ryan had to cover his eyes to protect himself from the light. An unstoppable force fighting an immovable object. The unstoppable force won. The force field shorted out, and Psyshock barely had the time to leap out of the biomechanical database before Fallout hit it. The blast vaporized the giant brain, organic and mechanical parts alike, and continued its way through the wall behind. Steel and glass both melted before this almighty power. All screens and lights turned black, leaving only Alphonse Monada's radiance to provide lighting, and the turrets abruptly stopped firing. With the dexterity of a spider on the run, Psyshock used his tendrils to jump across the room and attempted to bypass the trio. Ryan froze time and shot the tentacles supporting his weight, causing the psycho to crash on the ground before he could escape. Didn't you hear, PSY PSY? Ryan taunted him, shooting a tentacle before Psyshock could smash his skull with it. Today, we have fried squid on the menu. The rose on Enrique Manada's suit grew thorn tendrils, until the plant had become a floral squid as large as PSY PSY himself. Its roots restrained the psycho, while the flower unleashed a burst of colored smoke right in his face. Psyshock struggled for a moment, before his whole body went limp. I knew Dynami's perfumes were low quality, but not to the point of causing someone to faint, Ryan mused out loud. 
I used a genetically altered brand of aconitine, Blackthorn replied, which Ryan identified as a plant-based neurotoxin. Since Psyshock needs to die to activate his body transfer, hopefully keeping him in a state of unconsciousness should disable it. And since PSYPSY is almost entirely made of nerves, it's doubly effective against him, even with his enhanced biology. Ryan had to admit the idea was brilliant. Enough to shamelessly copy it in a later run. We do our research too, Romano, Blackthorn said dryly. You do not have a monopoly on intelligence. Fallout to all teams, Alphonse Manada spoke through an intercom in his suit. Adam is dead, and Psyshock is neutralized. Move to secure the site. Any idea what that was? Ryan asked, glancing at the spot where Big Fat Adam had perished. It couldn't have happened to a nicer guy, but the entity had singled the courier out among the group, much to his confusion. Blackthorn shook his head in disgust, and if the courier wasn't mistaken, a hint of remorse. It was our early days all over again. We had worse results, Fallout replied while receiving a response through his suit's intercom. Unlike his sibling, he couldn't care less. The drones and robots have deactivated, but Psyshock's thralls are still fighting. I must order a full wipeout. Much to Ryan's surprise, Blackthorn immediately protested. Al, they are not our enemies, they are victims. I do not like it either, but the lives of our soldiers take priority, Alphonse replied coldly. And the thralls fight to the death. Guys, I can stop time, Ryan declared, both Manada siblings looking at him. I can disarm and incapacitate people safely. Yes, Al, let us try to capture as many as we can first, Enrique asked his sibling. We may be able to cure them later. You and your sentimentality, Alphonse grunted, before barking orders through his intercom. You have ten minutes. No more. You heard him, Romano. Yeah, Greenhand, Ryan said, as they rushed through the hole in the wall. Frankly, I'm a bit surprised. I thought you wouldn't care about casualties. We can't always make the world a better place, Enrique replied with a shrug, but we have to try anyway. In the end, Ryan saved as many people as he could. He disabled suicide belts in the frozen time, disarmed more fighters than he could count, saved dozens of lives. But he couldn't save them all. When the courier emerged from the bunker through the half-melted blast doors, the battle had ended in a decisive carnival slash dynamis victory. Troopers had secured the junkyard, forming a defensive perimeter and establishing sniper nests atop the trash walls. The fact Leo Hargraves had torched half the area didn't bother them. Since he couldn't see the giant kaiju battle and the ground had stopped shaking, Ryan assumed both Frank the Mad and the Land had been defeated. Most of the metagang's cannon fodder had been restrained, bound either by iron chains or cocoons made of countless paper sheets bound together, either the carnival or dynamis had a paper manipulator on their payroll. Ace opened portals left and right to let troops through, the proudly carried a drugged out Psyshock in his arms to containment, and Leo Hargraves circled above Rust Town to survey the area. The message couldn't be clearer. The metagang was no more. Ryan should have felt happy about it, but the raid left him with a bittersweet feeling. Yes, he had fulfilled his promise to Jasmine and ensured Hanifat Lecter wouldn't fire an orbital laser at New Rome. But Dynamis now knew about the bunker, and Augustus would learn of the carnival's presence soon enough. One problem had been solved, but so many others remained. And one quickly called the courier. Romano. Enrique emerged from the bunker, his rose back on his suit. We have business ahead of us. Is it about the Beretta? Ryan asked. Frankly, he would return it on principle. The courier only accepted the best, and that gun wasn't all that great. You may keep it for now, the corpo replied with a scoff. This is not over yet. Stragglers to deal with? Can I run them over? I love doing that. Leave the mooks to our troops. Enrique raised his eyes, as Leo the Living Sun floated down to their position. Hargraves. Enrique, quick save, Sunshine greeted both of them as he landed on the ground. I assume the bunker is secured? Yes, it is, Enrique replied, looking at the Living Sun's head. You knew about it. 
Sunshine remained silent a split second, but was too much of a shining knight to lie. Yes. As I thought, Enrique replied, not truly surprised. I suppose you worried that word of this place might reach my father or Augustus. Wise, but troubling. You know this technology is dangerous. It ended the world once. In the right hands. There are no right hands, Enrique, Leonard interrupted Blackthorn, and Ryan was sorely tempted to agree. Mekran's legacy has to go. Perhaps. In any case, we can decide what to do with this bunker like civilized people, after we deal with the problem at hand. Enrique crossed his arms. What about you? I neutralized the land with Origami's help, the living son replied. And I'm confident we captured or killed almost every psycho active in Rust Town. The only ones unaccounted for are Incognito and Gemini. They must have used their powers to slip amidst your troops and escape. I do not worry about these two. Without Adam to provide direction, they will be nothing more than a nuisance. We'll catch them eventually. Then we should be done, Leonard said, arms crossed. Or are we? There is still one last source of concern, Enrique said as a noise echoed from above. Ryan raised his eyes, noticing a helicopter preparing to land. We found the evidence we needed, and Alphonse wants to arrest our father before he can organize a counter-coup. We're going to the family manor, and we will clean up this mess once and for all. I will go there first, Sunshine said, preparing to take flight. Make sure he does not get away. Do not engage and wait for us, Blackthorn commanded, Leo flying away with a nod. Once the living sun was gone, Enrique turned to look at Ryan. Considering you planned all of this, I thought you might wish to be present as well. Plan? Ryan chuckled. I don't plan, I adapt. You truly take me for a fool, Romano, Enrique replied with a frosty tone, but suit yourself. I warned you back then, once the day is done, we will have a talk. I will drive to our destination, Ryan said with a shrug. No offense, but my ride is classier than yours. Move quickly then, Enrique said, straightening his suit as his helicopter blew dust in all directions. History won't wait for you. If only he knew. Without wasting any more words, Ryan walked out of the junkyard and whistled as loudly as he could. His Plymouth Fury self drove to the trash labyrinth's entrance, spooking a few Dynami's troopers, but Ryan prevented them from committing suicide by raising his hand in peace. The second he sat on the driver's seat, Ryan turned on the chrono radio. Shorty? Shorty? For a short while, Ryan worried the answer would never come, but it did. Riri? Riri, can you hear me? Thank God, you're alive. The courier let out a sigh of pure relief before looking at the skies. Enrique's helicopter flew east of Rust Town after Leo Hargraves. Where are you? Are you alright? Is everything okay? I'm. I'm fine, she replied while the courier followed Enrique's helicopter. Under the sea. I fled through the tunnels when Dynamis invaded the lower levels. And I. Ryan's fingers tensed on the driving wheel. I have it, Len declared, a quiet sense of triumph in her voice, I have the brain tech. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to the perfect run. Chapter 63, End of Disc 1 Ryan had to give it to Hector Monada. In spite of being far richer than Augustus, he didn't show it. The CEO of Dynamis lived in a three-floor manor of yellow stones within walking distance of his company's HQ, north of New Rome. The property was big, but nothing compared to Mount Augustus, the architectural style reminded Ryan of South America's 19th century properties, though Hector had also gathered a sizable collection of Mesoamerican artifacts in his garden. Statues of Aztec gods lined the path to the house, like a private guard. And of course, the property crawled with private security guards with top-of-the-line weaponry. When Ryan arrived, Sunshine and Enrique's helicopter had already landed in the garden. Security guards checked on the courier, but let him pass unmolested, apparently, the siblings had forewarned them. Alphonse Manada had joined his brother, both backed by an elite security team. Leonard Hargraves had landed on the grass, though he somehow didn't set it on fire even while in his son form. 
Even Ryan had taken the time to change himself back to his old costume, Acid Rain having savaged the cashmere suit. One didn't confront a final boss without looking nice. But the scene quickly disappointed Ryan. Hector Manada wasn't raising a submachine gun to die in a blaze of glory, Scarface style. He didn't look worried about the urban warfare happening a few districts away from his house. In fact, he didn't seem troubled at all. For Hector Manada was gardening. I guess this is a family thing, Ryan said snidely, as the corporate mastermind tended to an ugly rose bush. The floral arrangements were terrible, the work of an amateur. Sons. A pudgy man with gray hair and a face resembling Pablo Escobar's, Hector Manada had traded the business suit for casual white clothes and a straw hat. If Ryan hadn't seen his face before, he might have mistaken him for a mere employee. I didn't expect you. Especially not in such. His eyes wandered to Leo Hargraves. Shining company. Surprised, father? Alphonse asked, his tone lacking any familial warmth whatsoever. Mr. Manada, Leo said, always polite. It has been a while. Not long enough, I must say, the CEO replied, before finally noticing Quick Save. And who might you be? Hi, I'm Quick Save, Ryan presented himself. I'm the guy who ruined all of your evil plans, but don't tell anyone. My evil plans? The CEO answered with a forced smile. I do not understand. I think you do, father, Enrique said, as he straightened his tie. We destroyed the metagang one hour ago. An action which I did not authorize, the CEO replied with a frown, before forgetting Ryan's existence and glancing at Alphonse instead. Nor do I remember recalling you to New Rome either. You forfeited any authority over me when you betrayed us all, father, Alphonse replied. You wanted to stay in power so much, you would rather clone yourself than let us inherit? Clone myself? Hector Manada feigned ignorance. We have Saishak in custody, father, Enrique said. He admitted everything. From your secret deal with Adam the Ogre to your mind-transferring project. Ryan knew it was probably a bluff, considering the timeline of events, but it worked like a charm. Is that so? Hector asked glancing at the soldiers following his sons. The courier could almost see the gears turning in the CEO's head, as he weighed his options. We have recordings, captured technicians, proof of monetary transactions, Enrique continued. Did you know the metagang had unearthed a Mechron base beneath Rust Town? Though he quickly corrected his expression, the CEO's brief look of genuine surprise told Ryan that no, he didn't. As the courier guessed, the metagang had planned to betray him from the start, take Dynami's elixirs, until they could overthrow the company with Mekron's weaponry. So you were a traitor and a fool, Alphonse Manada said, with a grunt of disgust. He had noticed the look of surprise too. You despise us so much? Can you blame me, Alphonse? Hector replied with a sneer. Sometimes I truly wonder if you came from my loins. You and Augustus would have turned Italy into a bloody battlefield if I hadn't sent you away. So instead you sent psychos to wage war for you? Enrique asked, shaking his head. I still remember what you told me when I welcomed Felix Varen into our fold. Don't rock the boat. Augustus' influence needs to be constrained, but we can't afford a direct confrontation, Hector snapped back. We have no means of getting rid of him permanently. We do. Alphonse said with confidence. The gravity gun. Your obsession with miracle weapons will be your undoing, Hector lambasted his son. If yours fails, we will have an invincible madman with nothing left to lose on our hands. Augustus will never be satisfied, Leonard Hargraves interrupted the conversation. He wants nothing less than total dominion over Europe. His delusions of grandeur mean nothing, Hector scoffed. You don't know him like I do, Hargraves. Sunshine scoffed. I have been sparring with Augustus long before you came to Italy, Mr. Manada. I know him well. No, Hargraves, because if you did, you would have grasped a simple truth. With all his power, Augustus could have established himself as a god-king, written laws, but what does he do? Peddle drugs, launder money, corrupt existing infrastructures. At the end of the day, Augustus is just a gangster with cancer, and that's all he will ever be. 
The CEO shook his head in frustration. Don't you see that to win, we only have to outlast him? Let nature do its work. And let countless suffer in the meantime? Sunshine replied. Assuming the next Augusti generation isn't made of the same cloth? Well, to be honest, Ryan raised his hand to speak on behalf of Livia. The adults are talking, quick save, Alphonse interrupted him. Then why are you here? Ryan replied with a mocking tone, being far, far older than the VP. The nuclear-powered cyborg glared at him, but the courier wasn't intimidated in the slightest. Enough, Enrique said, a hint of frustration in his voice. And are you truly so different, father? Alphonse asked mockingly. Hector's expression turned into one of pure disgust. You dare compare me to Augustus, my son? I am no saint, I confess, but I do not go around murdering people who never crossed me. You raised us to believe Dynamis had a mission. To rebuild a better civilization, based on free market, the rule of law, and individual freedom. Alphonse's voice turned bitter. One that wouldn't repeat the mistakes of the pre-war nations. Yet all you have done is repeat the patterns of the past, and maintain a status quo unsuitable for mankind. One that benefits Augustus. Ryan realized he had met Fallout's type elsewhere before. Disappointed idealists. And as he listened to the man's speech, he couldn't help but be reminded of Livia's own situation. Like her, the Manada were children disagreeing with their father's rotten, rigid vision of the world. Unlike Livia though, who couldn't escape Augustus' grasp, the Manada siblings had decided to rebel. Would it work though? That unsuitable status quo, as you call it, is the only one we have, Hector replied angrily. I've played with the cards dealt to me. Whatever your reasons, you conspired with the metagang, provided them with company resources, and, willingly or not, nearly allowed Adam the Ogre to get his hands on Mechran technology, Enrique pointed out. We can't let that slide, and neither will the board. I am the board, Hector replied with a frown. Ryan couldn't resist. Not yet. Alphonse and I have enough shares to force a vote, and you know the board and other corporations will vote for your retirement, Enrique said. We have too much proof, and they can't be seen cooperating with psychos. Our image and reputation is our armor, but they are also our weaknesses. And most importantly, we have the army, Alphonse stated the obvious. Do not think you can prevent what's coming. Hector's scowl deepened. You would harm me, my son. Your own father. After what you did? What you plan to do? Alphonse asked, lowering his head to lock eyes with his father. Yes, I would. Hector held the glare for a moment, before looking at his other child. ED2, Enrique? You know what your brother will do if he inherits my post? Yes, Enrique replied, but dabbling with psychos won't be one of them. Well said, brother, Alphonse added. Enrique will be my vice president, and we will clean up your mess. We will reforge Dynamis into what it should have been. A beacon that will rebuild civilization, one without psychos, and certainly without Augustus. You may have failed the dream, father, but we won't. Come with us, Mr. Manada. Sunshine briefly ramped up the heat around him. I promise you will not be harmed, and be entitled to a fair hearing. Take the graceful way out, father, Enrique pleaded, before glancing at Alphonse. Or else, it will have to be the other way. For a long, agonizing moment, Dynami's CEO said nothing. He slowly glanced at his sons, then at Leonard, and finally to the private security members backing them up. Whether out of fear of Alphonse Manada, disgust, or opportunism, none of them moved to shield their employer. It seemed that in Dynami's, power shifted swiftly. Eventually, although Ryan had prepared himself for a fight, Hector Manada offered his hands in surrender. You doom us all, fools. It is a new dawn for Dynamis, father, Alphonse Manada declared. He sounded quite pleased with himself. One long overdue. After me, the flood, Hector Manada prophesied with quiet dignity, as soldiers grabbed him by the arms. When Ryan glanced at the towering Alphonse, who watched his father being carried away, the time traveler realized he might have put someone far more dangerous in charge of Dynamis. That's it, 
The courier asked Enrique. After everything he did, you just talk it out? You expected a hail of gunfire perhaps? Ayel Miglior's manager replied dryly. Unlike Augustus, we do not shoot all of our problems. My father is many things, but a fanatic isn't one of them. He would rather go into forced retirement than die for nothing. So, what, you're going to imprison him on a private island, Napoleon style? Pretty much. If all goes as expected, his assets will be confiscated, he will be surrounded by Alphonse's people, and he will be kept away from any form of power whatsoever. Enrique looked at Ryan with disapproval. This is what we adults call diplomacy, Romano. It is boring, but it usually spares us a great deal of bloodshed. It, it was good. Ryan had expected the change of power to end in violence, because that was all he ever knew. If only more villains were reasonable, Leo Hargraves lamented. So, it's over. Now, we must decide what to do with the bunker. Not yet, Hargraves, Alphonse said. There will be a transition of power, and I wish you to assist us with it. I will pay you for your service. We do not work for money, Fallout. You misunderstand me, the cyborg replied with a hint of amusement. Our goals are the same. We both want Augustus dragged off from his throne. Now that my father has been dealt with, it is time we focus on the true enemy. The living son crossed his arms, the opportunity too great to pass up. I'm listening. Not here. Alphonse glared at Ryan next. And I have had enough of your blatant disrespect, quick save. You did your job, but that's it. Fuck off. Love you too, Nagasaki, Ryan replied and prepared to leave, having done what he had set out to do. Besides, staying in Alphonse Manada's company for too long would probably give him cancer. Ryan. Unlike Fallout, Sunshine bowed respectfully to the time traveler. There is something I must ask of you. Sorry, Sunshine, I won't join your circus, Ryan cut him off. Too much bad blood. I expected as much, Leo said with a sigh. Still, on behalf of the carnival, no, all of New Rome, thank you. Most people won't know it, but your actions saved countless lives. History books may not mention you, but we will not forget. Don't make promises you can't keep, Ryan replied with a shrug. But, thanks. That shiny paladin was too noble to dislike. While Ryan would have left the Monada property by himself, Enrique personally decided to escort him to his car. This isn't the end, is it? The courier asked Blackthorn. It didn't feel like an ending at all. It's just the beginning. Don Hector wasn't wrong. This is the calm before the storm, Romano. My brother is in charge, and he is not as subtle as our father. If Augustus didn't know we cooperated with Hargraves already, he will learn it soon. And even if it suffered heavy damage, that base below Rust Town contains a treasure trove of technology, and we must decide what to do with it. I guess overthrowing your father was the easy part, Ryan mused, his mood turning from curious to slightly depressed. I don't know how to feel about it. I've seen your reaction to my brother's speech, Enrique said. You seemed, troubled. Sharp. When I tried to overthrow my fatherly figure's hold on me, it ended with his death, Ryan replied, his thoughts turning to Len and Bloodstream. And even dead, his influence still holds a friend back. So when I looked at you too, I can't help but wonder what could have been. Enrique said nothing, and for that, the courier was thankful. However, when Ryan put a hand on his Plymouth Fury's door though, Blackthorn moved right in front of him. You are not leaving yet, the new Dynamis VP declared. I told you we would have a talk, Romano. We're having it now. What is there to say? Though if it's for gardening lessons, I guess you could make an appointment. We have plenty of things to discuss, Enrique said while crossing his arms. I know your sister was in the bunker during the attack. One of the Metagang's members was found trapped in a bubble, and Psyshock's living quarters were ransacked. And most curious of all, our men couldn't find the brain scanning technology our father lent him. I guess you should hire better people to do your groundwork, Mr. Nepotism. I wondered what your stakes were in this, but now I understand, Enrique said, ignoring the jab. 
You were after this tech from the start. This entire exercise was a distraction. Not really. Ryan's thoughts turned to Jasmine. If I told you the metagang caused the permanent death of someone I cared for, would you believe it? Permanent death? Enrique noticed the odd wording, but Ryan didn't enlighten him. People also saw you at a dinner with Livia Augusti and Fortuna Varen, and you apparently brought the latter home. Witnesses said the scene looked intimate. I'm putting an end to the rumors right here, Ryan said, immediately sensing the danger. Fortuna Varen isn't my girlfriend. I have standards. I doubt that, Enrique replied dryly. They also told me a person matching the Augusti assassin Mortimer's description came to your rescue against Acid Rain. You must understand that I am suspicious about your true allegiances. The courier shrugged. I've got no allegiances to any faction. I'm a wild card. Then you don't believe in anything? I thought you were a better man than that. Ah, uh, did you care? Much to Ryan's surprise, it seemed like Blackthorn did. For all your faults, Romano, you are a competent genome with great potential. I would not have given you the time of a day if I didn't believe it. You are a powerful fighter, a skilled tactician, and incredibly resourceful. I shudder to think what you could achieve, if you could look beyond childish self-gratification. Ryan wasn't certain if it was meant as a compliment or criticism. Probably both. I could return the sentiment, he said. I expected you to be a lot more cutthroat, but, you seem rather honorable and well-meaning below the surface. You could do a lot more for the world outside of Dynamis. You are wrong, Enrique replied. By themselves, humans can only do so much. We conquered the planet by sacrificing our individuality for collective strength. Though I do not share his methods, I agree with my brother's mission statement. Dynamis may not always change the world for the better, but it can. After seeing Rust Town, I somewhat doubt it, Ryan replied, before smiling behind his mask. But I'm an optimist. People can change. Even if there would be unintended consequences, the metagang's defeat had put the time traveler in a cheerful mood. After all the darkness of the previous failed run, this loop had proved he could turn things around. I do not trust you, Romano. You are unpredictable, loyal to none, and probably the most dangerous individual I have met short of Augustus. Thank you, Green Hand. Enrique put his hands in his pants pockets, the perfect picture of corporate confidence. However, you probably prevented a disaster and saved Dynamis, in a roundabout way. So, while I hate to use the term, I will look the other way this once. You are no longer welcome in I.L. Miglior though, I cannot look past your ties to the Augusti. At least Felix burned that bridge. It's fine, I took the job to do one thing, and it is finished. Ryan pointed a finger at the manager. I'm keeping all my merchandise rights though. Don't you dare sell quicksave miniatures. I will do my best to forget you even exist. I return the feeling. I'm still going to visit my team in the hospital though. Spoiler warning, if you try to stop me, you will fail. Here's what will happen, Romano. I will allow you to say your goodbyes to your teammates unmolested, and I will wire you a generous compensation for your service. Blackthorn locked eyes with Ryan through their respective masks. But afterward, you and your sister will leave. Leave for where? Anywhere, far, far away from New Rome, Enrique said. He will be too busy with the transition in the next few days to do so, but once his position is secure, my brother will hunt you two down. I know him. Your allegiances are too dubious, your ties to the Augusti too suspicious, and your sister too important. Ryan understood the Manada might want him gone now he had outlived his usefulness, but Shorty? Why were they so interested in her? What is it you're not telling me, Black Gardener? Enrique remained silent for a few seconds, his body so still the courier thought he might have turned into a statue. I let Len Sabino go once, he finally admitted but I cannot protect her forever. Alphonse knows her base's location, and he can access it if he so chooses. Take everything you can carry with you, and go. Ryan's tone turned dangerous. Is that a threat, Green Hand? Because as the metagang can attest, I'm very effective at killing weeds. 
Your brother won't be the first nuclear device I made go kaboom. No, Romano, it is not a threat. It is a warning. Strange as it may sound to you, I harbor no ill will towards you or your family. Blackthorn raised his sleeve to look at the time on his watch. I must go now. Though I have the feeling we will meet again. And Ryan felt it would be under circumstances far less friendly. Ryan was halfway to the harbor, when he received a call on his cell phone. Livia, he asked upon answering. Ryan, she answered on the other end of the line, a hint of worry breaking through her composure. How is Felix? Alive, but wounded, the courier answered. Livia sighed with relief on the other end of the line. He will recover, but they don't allow visits yet. I've tried. It's, it's fine, I'm glad he is alive at all. I did not inform his sisters yet. I, Livia gulped, I dreaded a different answer. I wouldn't have let him die, Ryan replied. Or rather, he would have reloaded afterward. Thanks for sending Mr. Pesemurail. He didn't help much, but it's the thought that counts. I guess you listened to me. About how we weren't enemies? Livia briefly paused before continuing. I hope I won't regret trusting you. You do work with my family's nemesis. Well, if it can reassure you, I've just been fired. She immediately seized the opportunity. Perhaps you would consider employment with us then? The Killer Seven are missing a Violet member. Sorry Princess, I'll stay a free spirit for a while, Ryan answered, as he reached the harbor. I'm not sure if my presence is needed anymore. I get the feeling Dynamis will hit your drug factory even without my influence. My father's reaction will be different if Dynamis does it, rather than an unknown party. But we can discuss that when the situation becomes clearer. When do you think Felix can receive visits? I'll be honest. I don't know, and I'm not sure you will even be able to visit Adam Kitten at all. Her tone harshened. You think Dynamis will prevent us access? No, I think Felix won't want to see you or his family. No answer. Hey, you can always try. If I'm right, I can carry a message if you want. The Mafia princess had fallen completely silent. Though he had only said the truth, Ryan regretted his bluntness. For a second, he had forgotten how emotionally fragile the woman truly was, beneath her icy facade. Livia? Have you ever loved someone? She asked out of the blue. Not a fling, but true love. To the point that even though you know it's over, you still cling to any hope you can turn things around? I'm really not the best counsel on the matter, Ryan said sadly, as he noticed Len's bathysphere near the old piers. I came to New Rome chasing after a ghost. So you do understand, she said with a sad chuckle, before gathering her breath. You lived for centuries. Don't you have wisdom to offer? Things can change, the courier admitted, before considering it thoughtfully. But sometimes, it's better to learn to let go. You'll hurt yourself otherwise. Some wounds never heal, and you have to live with them. Livia seemed to see the wisdom in his words, but she didn't appreciate it. Thanks for your answers, Ryan. You're welcome, the time traveler replied, before falling silent. His thoughts turned to the meeting with Dynamis. Ryan? The Manadas overthrew their father, Ryan said out of nowhere. They, talked it out and forced him into retirement. Now they intend to reform Dynamis into something better than before. He didn't even need to elaborate. Livia could probably see the parallels with her own situation, with a major difference. My father won't surrender with dignity, Ryan. No, probably not. Her regretful tone was heart-wrenching. I will get my cat back, Ryan said, changing the subject. The furry kind. I think I can arrange that, she replied with a chuckle, though it was mirthless. Goodbye Ryan. Goodbye princess, he said before hanging up on her and parking his car. Enrique and Alphonse had managed to free themselves from their father's hold. So why was it that Ryan couldn't help Len and Livia do the same? Bloodstream was long dead, and Augustus, for all his overwhelming power, couldn't overcome a mere tumor. No, the courier muttered to himself. I can't let them win. He couldn't let things end this way. 
Not again. Never again. He banished these thoughts and stepped out of his car. Len waited for him on the waterfront in full armor, two bathospheres floating in the sea nearby, she carried a device in her hands. A gray metal helmet with pylons protruding from the front, and with a plug at the back. Dynamis hadn't printed its logo on it, probably to avoid being tied to the metagang should the device be found. It's underwhelming, Ryan said as he rejoined his friend. I expected something more complex. It's only a small part, Len replied with a genuine smile. The mere sight caused Ryan to forget all his worries for a brief instant. I move the rest to your place. Your place. Such simple words, and yet so powerful. So, you were serious? Ryan asked. You're okay with me moving to your undersea paradise? Yes I am, she said with a nod, her smile faltering. It's over, right? You don't, you don't owe Dynamis anything anymore. No, and I've been fired anyway. Ryan would miss the condo, and he would steal a cashmere suit as a parting gift. I'm officially homeless again. Len considered her words for a second, but they came swiftly and firmly. No, Riri. No, you are not homeless. Ryan's heart skipped a beat for a moment, and he had to look away at the sea to hide his unease. It felt great to know Len wanted him back into her life. Even if their teenage relationship had long perished, she had Ryan's back, and he had hers. And with that tech, maybe his old lonely days would finally come to an end. You think it can work? Ryan asked for confirmation, praying not to be disappointed again. We will need time, but, maybe, Len said with a smile, perhaps the first time she had shown some optimism in a long, long time. We, we will need to extract the Krona radio from your car though. I have, a, uh, a bigger submarine. To bring it under the sea. An undersea garage. Marvelous. Frankly, if this loop doesn't end with my Plymouth Fury getting an underwater mode, I will be sorely disappointed, Ryan mused, before a darker thought crossed his mind. But we might have to move to another location. Dynamis won't leave your base alone for long. They're not going to let us be. Her sweet face turned into an angry scowl. I should have known. They'll never be satisfied. I don't get why they're so interested in you though, the courier admitted. Yeah, you attacked a factory, but that's peanuts compared to the Augusti and the Metagang. And in the end, it didn't cost them anything. Len sighed, as if reliving her failed youthful rebellion. I don't know, Riri. I think what they can't control, they destroy. No. Ryan sensed something bigger was at work, and it bothered him. What did they do when they captured you the first time? What questions did they ask? I don't. I don't remember much, she admitted. The first thing they did was to force me through a DNA test and take a blood sample. Afterward, nothing noteworthy. A sales pitch. A blood sample, you said? Why a blood sample of all things? And then it clicked. Memories flooded Ryan's brain, and he suddenly saw them under a new light. Lab 66. Enrique was supposed to oversee the whole elixir operation instead of Il Miglior. He visited the lab for two hours, and he immediately asked for a transfer afterward. If you ask me, there's something really shifty about the knockoffs, even Augustus scientists never found a way to copy them. Dynamis keeps the underdiver under close surveillance. You let her go? It was our early days all over again. I couldn't make elixirs. What I did was synthesize a specific resource that mimicked the properties of a true elixir. Such a shame, I would have loved to compare samples from various genome relatives. Various genome relatives. Genome relatives. Relatives. Len? Ryan asked, a terrible doubt creeping in his mind. When did Dynamis start producing their knockoff elixirs? Do you know the exact date? Uh. I'm not sure, I think. I think they had a few in development, but they only started flooding the market three years ago or so. Shorty shut her mouth, and Ryan instantly regretted asking that question. She was smart. She had figured it out too. It's impossible, the courier said immediately. 
It can't be that. But it would fit. Len protested, genuine emotion breaking through her monotone voice. It would explain it all. It. Len, your father is dead. The genius flinched, as Ryan's tone turned deadly serious. Sunshine burnt him to ashes. I saw it with my own two eyes. He's gone. But if one of his clones, Len locked eyes with her old friend. You know it's possible, Riri. You just don't want it to be. No, he didn't. Ryan wanted to think that nightmare was over. That bloodstream was dead and buried, and could no longer harm either of his children, adopted or otherwise. But Len had never truly woken up. Riri, I. I've trusted you, even after everything we. I've. I've killed for you, Riri. I trusted your words, I gave you a second chance. I. I'm willing to start fresh. She gathered her breath, struggling to find her words. I just. I just want to get closure, Riri. I want to know. If it's, if we're wrong, we can move on. But we need this. We need to check. But if our hunch is right? Ryan asked. What will you do? What will we do? Len bit her lower lips, and looked at her feet without a word. I just, Ryan gathered his breath, as he thought about his next words. I just want you to be free, Len. I want you to be free of him. To exorcise his ghost, so he no longer haunts you. You. He paused. Say it, Len said, without looking up. You remind me of a songbird in a cage, Len, Ryan admitted. You could be smiling and shine like the sun. You could fly away. The cage is open. But you're afraid he will close the door as you try to escape. No one will take away your freedom, but you're still afraid. Len looked back at her friend once more. Ryan, she said with an iron gaze. Not Riri. It's exactly why I won't budge on this. I need to know. I. I need to know. To get closure. Ryan wanted to argue further, but he could see in her gaze it was pointless. She wouldn't change her mind. And the worst part? While he hated to admit it, he needed to be sure too. Lab 66, the courier muttered to himself. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to the perfect run. Chapter 64, Past Fragment, A Death in Monaco. Ryan Romano died countless times, by his hand or that of someone else. But there was one death that trumped them all. The death that made him stop caring, and taught him to enjoy life. The perfect death, that no one should return from. This is the story of this death. This is the story of Monaco. April 1, 2017, France, Village of La Turbi. The sun was falling behind the horizon, and the city of Monaco shone from below. Standing at the edge of the Tête de Chien promontory, his trusty motorcycle and travel bag nearby, Ryan observed his target carefully. It had been five years since he had left Italy, and now was the moment of truth. Well, technically it had been three months, but he lived through them again, and again, and over again. He had toured the coasts of the Mediterranean Sea, looking for any sign of Len and her submarine. He knew they had planned to go to America before, before the separation, but she couldn't have crossed the Atlantic Ocean. She had to have stopped somewhere closer. Somewhere within his reach. However, Ryan was starting to lose hope. He had toured Greece, Spain, France, every place he could think of. He had wandered the post-war's wasteland, and came up short. And if she had left Europe completely, relocated underwater or on a distant island, he might as well look for a needle in a haystack. There was only one place around the Mediterranean Sea that Ryan hadn't visited yet. The country everyone warned him against. The place nobody returned from. Monaco, Ryan said, as he observed the coastal city. It looked, nice, for a lack of a better term. And it bothered him a great deal. First of all, the microstate was still standing. That alone was unusual. Monaco had once been one of Europe's most luxurious coastal resorts, a den for gamblers and millionaires, and somehow, it still looked the part after the apocalypse. 
It seemed the bombs, robots, and nanoplagues had stopped at the border. The buildings and houses had been spared from any degradation, and yet the time traveler didn't see anybody in the streets. Boats and yachts floated in the sea, empty cars formed long lines on the driveways, and Ryan couldn't hear any noise. Not even the song of birds. I know I'm tempting fate by saying this, Ryan muttered to himself, as he usually did to alleviate his loneliness, but I've got a bad feeling about this. The time traveler saved this very instant, just in case. Many had gone to Monaco, searching for supplies, elixirs, or a safe haven, but none returned. But none of these people could time travel either. Well, guess this is the last chance, Shorty, Ryan said, as he climbed on his motorcycle and drove towards the city. If you aren't in the place nobody returns from. Well, he could always try to cross the ocean and reach America, if it still existed. But most likely, Ryan would have to face the obvious. That Len was gone. The time traveler had made his presence obvious, sent signals through radio towers and whatever communication channels he could find. If she hadn't contacted him yet, then she was either unable to respond or dead. And Ryan didn't know what to do, if he gave up on his friend. His quest to find Len had guided him through so many restarts, and he had no other purpose in life. No cause to dedicate himself to. The time traveler had been feeling adrift ever since Bloodstream's death, and not even his power could counter his gnawing sense of solitude. Without Len, his existence had no meaning. Ryan chased away these thoughts, climbed on his motorcycle, and followed the path down towards Monaco. As he reached the city's official frontier, the time traveler noticed a badly painted sign on the side of the road. The armies of Andorra shall never conquer our great nation. Ryan read out loud. Wasn't Andorra another microstate? The apocalypse truly caused all the weirdos to crawl out of hiding. Ryan drove through the streets of Monaco, and much to his surprise, nothing terrible happened. He didn't instantly fall dead, and no crazy psycho ambushed him. It was almost disappointing. However, the time traveler sensed the pervading tension in the air. The streets were clean, the cars were all parked in the right spot, and the streetlight somehow worked perfectly, yet Ryan knew the city needed to import electricity from the French Republic, which had long collapsed. When he peeked through houses' windows, he found them empty. Ryan made his way to Monaco's most well-known landmark, the Place du Casino. The famous Monte Carlo Casino stood strong and proud, its 19th-century magnificence preserved from the apocalypse. The clock above the entrance remained stuck at 12, though the lights remained functional. The fountain in front of the entrance worked too, surrounded by a lush lane and floral arrangements. Is there someone here? Ryan asked, tempting fate. Only a heavy silence answered. Well, maybe he should look. The plaza vanished in a flash of yellow and violet. In the blink of an eye, Ryan found himself inside a luxurious marble hallway. Paintings adorned the walls, chandeliers provided some light, and the room led towards large wooden doors. After a brief moment of surprise, Ryan looked around, but found himself back against a wall with only his bag of supplies. Had he been teleported somewhere else? Ryan glanced at the paintings, most of them drawn in a surrealist style reminding him of René Magritte's. One painting, The Genesis, showed two gloved hands opening an alchemist wonder box. Another, The Triumph of Monaco, represented an army of golden men overrunning Mechron's robots. Perplexed, Ryan grabbed his supply bag and walked through the hallway until he reached the doors at the end. He noticed a sign above them, exquisitely painted with the brightest colors possible. Monte Carlo Grand Opening. However, next to that sign, Ryan noticed words crudely carved into the marble wall. Don't trust the clowns they will eat your heart. Ryan continued reading, finding more advice carved into the stone. Follow the arrows to the sweets before it goes dark. A second sentence was written next to it. Whoever carved it had done so in a hurry, don't use the stairs take the elevator. Ryan lowered his gaze, noticing arrows carved on the floor. More and more confused, he opened the wooden doors and walked into the next room. Much to his surprise, Ryan entered a replica of the Monte Carlo Casino, or at least, what little he had seen from pre-war's pictures. 
His steps echoed in a vast lobby supported by pillars, the ground replaced with a giant roulette table with one meter wide tokens. Candelabras dangling from the ceiling provided the light, and the art decoration was the peak of 19th century luxury. Ryan glanced at the windows, but all of them were walled off with marble. Hello, dear guest, a voice said at Ryan's left, someone having snuck up on him. Ah. Ryan took a step back, and instantly activated his time stop. Or so he tried. He felt his ability strain against an invisible force for a brief second, but time refused to stop. Panicking, Ryan drew a gun hidden beneath his clothes, only to quickly realize his mistake. The creature in front of him looked like a human, but only superficially so. Its skin was unnaturally white, and most importantly, a clownish mask made of solid gold served as its face. It wore a croupier's costume, including a bow tie, an old jacket, and gloves. Welcome to Monaco, said the clown with a cheerful voice, the gold mask moving unnaturally with each new word. Its eyes and mouth oozed darkness. The greatest country on earth. How may I assist you? Ryan tried to stop time again, but something prevented his ability from activating. Damn it, did this place interfere with his power? In that case, if Ryan died within these walls. Where am I, Pennywise, the time traveler asked, keeping his gun pointed at the clown creature. In Monaco, of course. The greatest, most prosperous nation on earth, by the divine providence of his highness Jean Stephanie. Oh, a new guest. Ryan heard a new voice, as another clown walked into the lobby, albeit with a face of bronze instead of gold. Like its fellow clown, it wore a croupier outfit and carried a silver plate under its arm. Welcome. Can I offer you a drink? What, what the hell? Did Ryan enter a Stephen King novel by accident? Jean Stephanie, he repeated, unsure which of these two clowns to shoot first. His Highness Jean Stephanie I, Sovereign Prince of Monaco, Conqueror of Liechtenstein and San Marino. The golden clown waved a hand at a marble statue near the pillars, representing a strange creature in a flattering position. The figure vaguely reminded Ryan of a man in a suit with a fedora, but with elongated arms and distorted facial features. His Highness rose from humble birth to ascend to the throne of Monaco in 2005, by virtue of everyone else being dead. It said that with such cheerfulness too. Ever since, he has bravely defended Monaco against the Andorran hordes trying to destroy our great nation, the bronze clown continued, before pointing his hand in one direction east of the lobby. Now, I can show you our five stars restaurant, if you wish for a warm meal. Or perhaps you would prefer to enjoy a game of roulette? Why are the windows walled off? Ryan asked, as he glanced at the ground. The arrows carved on the floor pointed west. Where's the exit? Why would you want to leave Monaco, the bronze clown asked with a chuckle. Why would anyone want to leave Monaco, the greatest nation on earth? I do, Ryan asked, more and more uncomfortable. But you are a guest, you have been invited, the servant continued, its mask morphing into a disturbing smile. While he sounded innocent and cheerful, something in his tone made Ryan shiver. We are at your service during opening hours. We are always there for you, dear guest. The more he stayed in their company, the more uneasy Ryan grew. Their kindness felt fake and forced. I'll come back later, he promised, following the arrows. But we'll be closed soon, the golden clown said, as he and the other servant followed Ryan. Their posture had changed slightly, turning threatening. We will be closed very, very soon. You stay away. Ryan raised a gun at them, before noticing other clowns making their way into the lobby. While all of them dressed like croupiers, their masks were made of bronze, silver, or gold. Though they maintained a respectable distance, they still stalked the time traveler like a smiling pack of wolves. I'm not afraid of clowns. We only want to help you, dear guest, the bronze clown said. He tried to sound reassuring, but it just came off as creepy. We exist to serve man. Ryan remembered the message at the entrance, and suddenly wondered if the sentence had a double meaning. He followed the arrow trail and eventually reached an open elevator in between two stairways. The wanderer briefly looked at them, only to notice bear traps and wires placed on the staircases. With no other way out, 
he walked inside the elevator while threatening the clowns with his weapon. The genome noticed a sign saying, here right next to the fourth floor button, and smashed it as hard as he could. The door closed in front of Ryan, as a dozen masked creatures glared at him in eerie silence. Dear guests. Ryan froze, as he heard a male voice come from the elevator's loudspeaker. We must inform you that due to a national emergency, the Monte Carlo Casino will close early. But I assure you that, as long as His Highness Jean Stephanie protects us, the armies of Andorra shall never destroy our principality. Long live Monaco. What the hell was this place? When the elevator reached the fourth floor with a ding sound, the lights had gone out, and the elevator's doors closed the second Ryan exited it. He also heard a sound coming from below, someone having triggered the wire trap. Sensing that things would get ugly very soon, Ryan grabbed his cell phone and activated the torchlight option. The area looked like a hallway leading to various hotel suites, though the walls and doors had been reinforced with steel plates. Only one room, numbered 44, seemed to have light coming from the other side, so Ryan quickly knocked on its door. Hey, he shouted as loud as he could, though nobody answered. Is somebody there? Hey! Ding! Ryan looked at the elevator as its doors opened, half a dozen clowns emerging from it. This time, they didn't invite him politely, or even say a word. Instead, they each carried silver forks and knives in hands, and napkins around their necks. And that's why children don't like clowns anymore. Ryan opened fire with his gun, while trying to stop time once more. Not only did his power fail to activate, but a silver clown took a bullet to the face without slowing down. The suite's doors opened, and someone stepped out. To Ryan's relief, though, his savior was a normal human, albeit one built like Conan the Barbarian. His savior wore some kind of scavenged outfit composed of an American football player's helmet and pads, reinforced with pieces of medieval armor. And most importantly, he carried a shotgun. I knew I heard something. The man spoke in French, clocking his shotgun. The face beneath the helmet was wrinkled, the eyes an icy blue. Move out. Ryan immediately stepped out of his savior's way, as he fired the shotgun. The shot blasted a bronze clown apart, the creature leaking a white liquid rather than blood. However, the others quickly pushed the corpse out of the way and rushed at the humans with hungry looks. Go, 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 the man shouted at the time traveler, and both bravely fled into the suite. The armored figure quickly closed the door behind them and locked the door, Ryan hearing a loud thump on the other side. The malevolent croupiers started screaming beyond the metal door, pummeling it with all their strength, but it held. One day, before arthritis gets to me, I'm going to go kamikaze on your ass, the armored man shouted through the door. I'll shoot you all up like Tony Montana, and kill every last one of you. He then turned to Ryan. You alright, kid? I think so, Ryan gathered his breath and looked around. As implied from the outside, the area was a luxurious hotel suite, big enough to welcome an entire family. Decorated in the 19th French century style, the place had walls white as snow, and windows walled off with marble. The suite included various amenities, from a sofa with TV, to a library and even a bar counter. Most strangely, Ryan also noticed a hole dug into one of the walls, a pickaxe nearby. You sound Italian, are you a rital? the armored asked, switching to Italian. He completely ignored the noises coming from outside and moved to the counter, leaving his shotgun within arm's reach. He removed his helmet, revealing his utter baldness, Ryan would peg him around 60, maybe a bit more. You've wandered far away from your country, Macaroni. What's your name? Ryan, you French cheese, the traveler replied gruffly. Ryan Romano. Name's Simon. I'm the sheriff of Sweetstown. The man said while bringing out two glasses and a bottle of brandy. Which date is it outside? Gotta check. 1st of April, 2017, Ryan replied with a frown. The man let out a heavy sigh. Fuck, 12 years, man. 12 years trapped in this place. Is the planet still an irradiated dump? Yeah, but where are we? Ryan asked, demanding answers. Is this the Monte Carlo? I would say hell, but you're not that lucky. 
you're in Monaco. The real Monaco, that nobody comes back from. An alarm echoed in the room, and Simon looked beneath the counter to grab a landline phone. Yeah, Martine? Though he didn't understand the conversation. Ryan heard a woman's voice on the other side of the line. Yeah, yeah, a new guy arrived and the croupiers followed him. Yeah, he's safe. Don't worry. Simon looked at Ryan dead in the eyes. You've got weapons in your bag? Uh, three guns, bullets, medical supplies, food, and water. Good. Gonna ask you to share. No selfish freeloaders here. Simon then focused on the phone. Yeah Martine, we'll meet tomorrow. Take care. You said you were the sheriff of Sweetstown? Ryan pointed out after Simon hung up, carefully accepting the glass. He noticed a book at the edge of the counter, The Myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus. We're about 40 people spread all over the fourth floor, the man explained. I'm keeping the elevator border secure, maintaining the stairs traps. If we force the croupiers to use the elevator, it creates a bottleneck. Makes them manageable. Have you seen anyone called Len? Ryan asked, finding a ray of hope in this insane nightmare. Len Sabino. Black hair, blue eyes, Marxist-Leninist. She must have arrived here one year ago. Ain't seen any commies yet, and I've been here for a while. Might be dead though. People like you, who arrive during the opening hours, they're the lucky ones. Those who arrive at a bad time, well, Simon gestured at the door. They get eaten. So Len was either dead, or not in this place. Ryan prayed for the latter. Are there. There's no other sanctuary, and no exit either, Simon said bluntly. The suites are the only safe zones. Something keeps them out, but only if the door is locked. We'll find you a suite of your own. The man gave Ryan a fiendish smirk. You're going to stay here for a while, Petit Rydal. Damn it. Ten hours. The clown's assault lasted for ten hours. They screamed and hit the door without any rest. When the lights returned in the hallway though, the attack stopped abruptly. The clowns calmed themselves and returned to the lower floor, as it turned out, they only turned hostile during closed hours. The next day, Simon introduced Ryan to the community's Mayor Martine, a 28-year-old blonde living four rooms ahead of the elevator border. She quickly gave him a rundown of the situation. Everyone in the town had the same story. They came to Monaco, either unaware of the danger, or underestimating it, and ended up teleported into the entrance hallway. Simon had been here the longest, a few months after the genome wars started. Nobody else had powers, and Ryan's own time stop didn't work in that strange place. Well, he still sensed his ability activating, but an opposing force cancelled it at the last minute. When he learned more information about this place, the time traveler eventually realized why. The Monte Carlo Casino was a pocket dimension. Or at least, that was Ryan's best guess. Besides the suite's floor, every room was a variant of eight others, a kitchen restaurant, a giant roulette table, a lobby, a slot machines room, a retail shop, a card game arena, a stocking area, and a theater. Each room led to another, never in the same configuration, forming a giant maze with only the elevator and the entrance hallway as the landmarks. According to the explorer's estimation, the area covered at least 8 square kilometers, four times the size of Monaco itself. And they kept discovering new rooms. It reminded Ryan of a dungeon crawl video game, with computer-generated rooms. Except it was a lot less amusing than he remembered. At least the coffee and restaurants restocked regularly, though nobody knew how it worked. Someone once placed a camera in a kitchen to record the phenomenon, and the food and water magically appeared during the closed hours. Ryan wasn't certain if his save point still worked. There was only one way to find out, and he wasn't in a hurry to try the noose checkout. He had died a dozen times, and each experience had been harrowing so far. Many had told him death was a peaceful end, but they clearly never died before. The community was divided into groups, each with a specific task, from explorers mapping the maze, to gatherers looking for food. Since he was one of the few experienced with firearms, Ryan quickly became Simon's deputy, with his own suite right next to the elevator. 
Right now, the time traveler was escorting Martine's group as they scavenged food. And he regretted it. Dear guest, I hope you have a happy time in Monaco, the greatest nation on earth, a silver clown told Ryan, presenting him with a plate full of exquisite shrimps and salmon toasts. May I offer you these gifts from our chef? Screw off, Ryan replied, threatening the croupier with a gun. Martine, less categorical, swiped all the toasts away and put it in a bag. The clowns were completely friendly during opening hours, which in Ryan's mind, made them even creepier. They switched from false affability to murderous hunger eerily fast, and they were frighteningly good at sneaking up on people. Worst, the Monte Carlo casino often closed early, at the whims of whatever force controlled the loudspeakers. The first time it happened, with only five minutes to return to the suites, Ryan thought his last hour had come. If he hadn't made a mad dash at the elevator, he would have certainly perished. A voice echoed through the loudspeakers. For a moment Ryan dreaded it might announce an emergency closing, but it was just the usual nonsense. Today is a great day for Monaco. Our soldiers won a great victory against the Duke of Luxembourg. The blood of our enemies shall paint our yachts. Monaco had been at war with Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Andorra, San Marino, but never the same one each day. Rise, Monaco, rise, the voice continued. Long live Jean Stephanie. I'm not even sure he exists, Martine told Ryan, nobody's ever seen him, not even the clowns. Because his highness is beyond our comprehension, one of the creatures interjected, only to be ignored. Long live Jean Stephanie. Could be a psycho, Ryan said as the group finished its scavenging and returned to the elevator. If it interfered with his power, then it was probably a violet. Though I don't get why nobody came after me. Perhaps his power sustains him, Martine offered, as they returned to the suite's floor. Any progress with your radio? Nope. Some of the books the group managed to scavenge included manuals or pre-wars technology magazines. Ryan thought he could perhaps create a radio powerful enough to call for a rescue. It was a fool's hope, but until someone found an exit, it was all the group had. Wanna watch a movie tonight? Martine offered him. I found a cassette of La Grande Vadrouille the other day. It's not high comedy, but it helps pass time. Maybe another day, Ryan replied, stopping in front of Simon's room. Gotta check on the old man. I just don't get why he keeps digging, the mayor sighed. I guess he's occupying himself the best way he can. Ryan shrugged and unlocked Simon's door. As the deputy, he had a double of everyone's keys. After closing the door behind him, Ryan made his way to the hole in the wall, activated a torchlight, and walked inside. It took him more than an hour, but he finally heard the sound of a pickaxe hitting stone. Simon was busy digging with a torchlight strapped to his helmet. Hi, Simon, Ryan announced his presence, though the sheriff didn't stop. We've got shrimp for tonight. Ugh, I would kill for a hamburger, the man complained, hitting the wall with his pickaxe. How long has it been since you joined us, Petit Rydal? Six months. Six months, which means two more until they change the menu. They do that each time on Christmas. The old man let out a sigh. You know, there was this guy, who had a puppy dog. He thought it was cute, so he kept sending me pictures. Every time I looked at the furred thing, it kept barking at me. It barked, and barked, and barked. It was annoying like you wouldn't believe. Every time it got on my nerves, I wondered, how does he taste? The guy? Ryan asked, a bit uncomfortable with the discussion. The puppy, Simon said. And one day. I couldn't resist. There wasn't much meat, but it tasted good. Like a Christmas gift I offered myself. I'm not sure I understand where this is going. God put us on earth for a reason, Petit Rydal. Simon said while making a short pause. Mine was to eat puppies. When I look at these rabid clowns outside, they all look like puppies to me. Ryan suddenly realized that years trapped inside a hotel suite did wonders for a man's sanity. The wanderer dreaded to imagine how he would look ten years from now. How long is your tunnel now? Two kilometers, Petit Rydal. Two kilometers, Ryan repeated. How had the whole thing not collapsed on him yet? 
Your tunnel is 2 kilometers long now. I have enough energy for 10 more. I'm just saying, I don't think there's an exit this way. Though Ryan hadn't given up on finding one, he had the intuition this insane dimension expanded endlessly. I don't get why you keep digging. The older man looked into Ryan's eyes. Have you ever read The Myth of Sisyphus? No, but I probably will, since you pitch it to me all the time. In it, Camus presents the fate of Sisyphus, forced to roll a boulder for all eternity. A purely meaningless task. But when he finally realizes that it's futile, and he stops struggling against his fate, he is truly free. He has accepted his situation, and through acceptance, found happiness. So you, what, you think will never escape? Ryan asked with a disgusted frown. That all our efforts are for naught? Yes, our efforts are futile. But I accepted them as meaningless, so I'm at peace with myself. You though, Petit Rydal? You still think you'll get out, and the more you fail, the more frustrated you become. There's someone waiting for me outside, Ryan pointed out, remembering Len. I don't think so, Simon replied with a shrug. But suit yourself. I'm just telling you the secret of happiness, but I can't force it on you. What I'm saying is, when you're confronted with meaningless absurdity, you've just got to roll with it. Like the boulder. That's ridiculous. One day, you will realize the boulder isn't your enemy, Simon shrugged. It's your friend. What happens if, through some miracle, you reach an end, Ryan said. But instead of an exit, your tunnel leads to another suite? How would you react? I'll find a new wall, Simon replied with a bright smile, as he raised his pickaxe again, and dig another hole. Ryan opened his mouth, closed it, and then opened it again. The boulder is your friend, he asked with a frown. The boulder is your only friend. It was December 2035 in Sweetstown, and little had changed except the menu. Nobody had entered the maze for years, probably because people finally wised up to the danger of Monaco. Or perhaps their mysterious abductor had died, and his dimension kept working without him. Whatever the case, with no fresh blood, the community's numbers had started to dwindle. Once nearly 50 at their peak, they were now half that number. Some had been eaten by the clowns, while others, just gave up. Simon ended up committing harakiri yesterday, as he promised he would. He went out one night to die like a man, a cigar in the mouth, a bottle of vodka in his left hand, and his shotgun in the right. In the end, the croupiers didn't kill him, though many of them died trying. Instead, the old sheriff's heart had failed him, unable to handle the stress of battle. The creatures hadn't eaten the body, though Ryan wasn't sure if it was because Simon scared them even in death or out of twisted respect. The villagers burnt the corpse and buried the bones beneath the bar counter he loved so much, and Ryan had taken over as Swightstown's sheriff. He even inherited Simon's suite. And now? Ryan faced the tunnel, wondering what to do with it. Simon boasted he had reached the 5 kilometers mark before perishing, and would have probably continued had his body not failed him. He even left his pickaxe right next to the entrance, by now it had grown rugged from overuse, and could hardly dig anymore. And yet. The boulder is your friend, huh, Ryan muttered to himself, as he grabbed the pickaxe. It was December 2101 in Sweetstown, and Ryan was the last man in Monaco. He rested on his bed, a pile of food within arm's reach, scribbling his life's memoir inside a journal. Though nobody new arrived in decades, he wanted to leave any help he could in case someone ended up trapped in Monaco. Over the century, the wanderer had explored the Monte Carlo casino farther than anyone, but learned little more. The maze truly was infinite, as far as he could tell. None of the systems needed electricity to work, the landline phones linking the rooms functioning even while cut off from one another. There was no central communication system to carry orders through loudspeakers, no birthplace for the staff. This place made no sense. It was a conceptual space, with no logic but the maker's will. It had to be a yellow genome's doing, but Ryan could never confirm it. He had tried everything, from radios to bombs. He had blown up the entrance hallway, dissected the clowns, and even attempted bizarre occult rituals when all else failed. Nothing worked. There was only one way to escape this place, and Ryan had the feeling it would happen soon. 
Two decades ago, when there were only five of them left with most too old to survive without help, the survivors summoned a meeting. All of them decided to take the bullet checkout option, except Ryan. He had died too many times already to want to hurry it up. A clown knocked on his suite's door, interrupting his work. Dear guest, perhaps you would enjoy a game of Baccarat downstairs? We are organizing a tournament just for you. No thanks, Ryan rasped, refusing to leave his bed. They waited at the door day and night, those assholes. They waited for him to die like hungry hyenas stalking an old lion. But the time traveler refused to perish out of sheer spite. As a genome, inherently better than humans, Ryan had aged gracefully. While his body showed wrinkles, he kept the vigor of a middle-aged man even while past a century old. And then, Ryan's health suddenly started deteriorating one year ago. Perhaps his elixir-enhanced body came with an expiration date, or it was just the accumulated toll of living so long without natural light, fresh air, or company. Thirty days ago, the genome woke up only to realize he couldn't move far from his bed without collapsing. Thankfully, he had accumulated a food and water reserve just for this occasion. Ryan slightly regretted not going on a suicide run like Simon when he had the chance. At least he would deny his jailers any satisfaction in his own way. His old eyes wandered to the edge of his room, and the tunnel beyond. He had almost reached the 15 kilometers mark when his body finally failed him, and it would remain one of his last regrets. But most of all, Ryan regretted never finding Len. Never knowing what happened to her. He had learned a great many things over the years, devouring any source of knowledge he could find, sharpening his fighting skills, but he never discovered how the world continued beyond these walls. He would die with unfinished business. That was the most ignominious part. But, well, it had been a life at least. He had defeated Bloodstream, and made sure he would never kill anyone again. Ryan hadn't done everything he could have done, but he tried. Maybe it was an old man's last attempt at comforting his guilty conscience, but, as he closed his eyes for the last time, the wanderer thought he had found the acceptance Simon preached to him so long ago. Accepting his fate didn't bring him happiness. But it brought him closure. And so, Ryan slept. And he woke up again, facing a bright light. What is, the wanderer raised his hand, the overwhelming radiance too much for him. It burned his eyes with its brilliance, and that strange force brushing against his cheeks. Was it, wind? When Ryan acclimated to the light, he realized he was facing the sun. His hand was no longer wrinkled, his legs could still carry him, and he felt young again. So very young, so very strong. He breathed fresh air again, for the first time in almost a century. As he looked down, and observed Monaco from above, it didn't take Ryan long to realize where he was. It was the same stone promontory where he last saved, almost a century ago. But I, but I died. I died in Monaco, and my power, did the pocket dimension prevent the time stop, but not the save point? And yet, the way he perished. It couldn't be mistaken for anything else. Ryan knew it deep within his bones. Old age. Ryan Romano had died of old age. And the whole thing started. All. Over. Again. I can't die of old age, Ryan realized, as he collapsed to his knees. I'm. I'm immortal. I'm immortal. It. It would never end. It would never, ever end. He would always start over, all over again. Forever and ever. Though it could prevent the time stop, even Monaco couldn't undo the save point. Even old age wouldn't cancel his save point. Ah, Ryan chuckled to himself. Ah. Ryan exploded into nervous laughter, rolling on the stone near his motorcycle. He didn't know how long he laughed, but by the end, the sun had long vanished, and his throat felt sore. Then the time traveler rested on his back, looking at the stars in silence for half an hour. Finally, when he rose up and looked at the stars, Ryan realized that he felt nothing. He had been scared of death before. Dreaded it. He feared the pain, the loss, the brief oblivion after the light went out. Dying wasn't fun. But that was before. Now. Now, he was no longer scared. 
death no longer felt painful. After realizing even old age wouldn't put him down for long, the wanderer had grown numb to it all. Ryan Romano was condemned to live. To carry that boulder at the top of the hill, and begin again. He remembered Simon's words, and realized the old man might have been right. The time traveler was Sisyphus reborn, and his life was absurd. And instead of horror, Ryan felt a deep sense of liberation. You know what, the time traveler muttered to himself, looking down at Monaco below. I don't care anymore. If Ryan was condemned to live, it would be to the fullest. He was no longer afraid of anything, and he had all the time in the world. All the time to see how everything could play out, to try everything worth doing. His life was an endless game, and the sky was the limit. He was free to anything he wanted. And right now, Ryan wanted to free Simon, Martine, and everyone trapped in this hellish place. If the time traveler's life were a video game, it would be his first quest. The first of many, but far from the last. And after seeing the bad end, he wouldn't settle for anything less than the perfect ending. Ryan had embraced the absurd, and learned to love the boulder. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to The Perfect Run. Chapter 65, In Mysterious Ways Sitting on a sofa right next to the inactive plushie, Ryan stared into the abyss of the Tyrrhenian Sea. He found it relaxing to wake up to the sight of silent darkness and mutated fish, especially after he had grown used to New Rome's noisy environment. Each apartment was a carbon copy of the other, each tenant free to decorate their own as they saw fit. Ryan had of course brought his entire wardrobe, and thrown Euro bills everywhere to protect himself from the specter of Vladimir Lenin. It certainly haunted this underwater Kremlin. As it turned out, Len meant that she had borrowed the Meta's own submarine during the raid. Now the vehicle waited right outside the underwater habitats, and Ryan had an excellent view of it from his underwater apartment. However, while the submarine had allowed Len to smuggle the Plymouth Fury to her base, it also meant that the Metagang could reach the area if they wanted. The courier would keep it in mind for future loops. Don't do anything rash, Ryan jokingly told the plushie while rising up from his sofa. He then moved through the corridors linking the underwater habitats together. Shorty's own lair was next door to his own, probably because she worried the courier might influence the kids without surveillance. Besides her own habitat, Len had established a workshop close to the living spaces. Unlike the comfortable apartments, this part of the underwater base reminded Ryan of a steampunk factory, all metal walls, and steam pipes. It wasn't as well equipped as Vulcan's, and far less organized, Len had hooked the servers administering the underwater base to Dynami's brain scan machine, while half-finished machines covered various workbenches. Len had hung designs of submarines, underwater cocoons, and even artificial fish on the walls to save space. Most important, Ryan's Plymouth Fury waited in a corner. Len had removed the Chrono Radio's components, the engine, and pretty much every piece of genius tech inside. He knew it was a sacrifice for the cause, but the sight of his beloved car turned into a husk filled the courier's heart with sorrow. And of course, Len listened to Alessandra Ensemble's March of the Artillerymen while working. Even Ryan had to admit that it was a good song, but his genius friend couldn't look more Marxist even if she tried. Thankfully, somebody else was already annoying her today. But Mama, you said I would get a suit too. Little Sarah complained to Len, carrying a cat in her arms. The genius was sitting behind a workbench, working on the Dynami's tech. That I would be the little diver. Sweetie, I know, but I have to work on something else first, for once, Len had traded her jumpsuit for simple blue clothes. She looked a lot more lively when she turned to face Ryan, perhaps because she felt more confident inside her lair. Hi, Riri. Hi Shorty, little Hellion, Ryan greeted them, before recognizing the cat in Sarah's arms. Eugene Henry. He showed up in my room this morning, little Sarah said, the animal meowing in her arms. Did you bring him from the surface to the magical place? No, he brought himself, Ryan replied, immediately petting the placid cat behind the ears. The feline's teleportation ability had an enormous range. Also, it's called the Kami Cave. The Ark, Len said with a frown. The Kami Cave, Ryan insisted. Corpos are a cowardly and superstitious lot. 
To instill fear in their heart, we must abolish private property. Len rolled her eyes. If this is, a bat cave, what do we call ourselves? The hammer and the sickle, Ryan immediately answered. The perfect union of peasant and working class superheroes. The children can become our minions, the proletariat. Len let out a small sound that the courier hadn't heard in centuries. Ma? Sarah asked, having never heard it either. Shorty, you chuckled? Ryan asked. Len tried to look away to hide her facial expression, but he was persistent. Even you must admit my jokes are funny. No, they aren't, his old friend replied while trying not to smirk. You're bad, Riri. You're so bad, it loops back to good. Like a, like a boomerang. What can I say, all my jokes are state approved by our Soviet Supreme. Len now wore a warm smile on her face, which in Ryan's mind was worth all the runs so far. I'm not like that, Riri. What's a Soviet Supreme? Little Sarah asked while petting Eugene Henry. Wait, you didn't send her to the party congress? Ryan frowned at Len. These children will be lost without a good revolutionary education. Len shook her head, the smile still on her face. I... I haven't thought much about education, she admitted. I was, too focused on building the place first. What's a Soviet Supreme? Little Sarah asked, before glaring at Ryan. Talk, motherfucker. It's a bad idea, Ryan answered truthfully before patting Sarah on the head. And that's all you will ever know. Sarah immediately stuck out her tongue at him, causing Eugene Henry to meow loudly and leap out of her hands. He immediately took over a server as his throne, looking down at the humans like a noble sphinx. Sweetie, can you leave us for a moment? Len asked Sarah. I... I need to discuss something with Riri. Privately. Little Sarah looked at Ryan and Len in turn, her gaze turning very, very suspicious. Yes, Ma. The little girl left while squinting at them, and Ryan sat on the workbench once she was gone. Are you happy now? They will think we do adult things behind closed doors, though we did, long ago. That was, Len's face turned embarrassed. Awkward. Well, it was both our first time. And they had to do it in a hurry, so her father wouldn't notice. I remember it fondly. Len didn't answer, probably because they discussed an era long gone. Ryan still longed for the emotional intimacy they once shared however. Maybe that was what he was looking for with Jasmine, the echo of something once vibrant, yet long dead. Was that how Livia felt whenever she thought of Felix? Have you made progress? Ryan changed the subject upon sensing Len's lack of comfort with the discussion. Sort of, she replied, joining her fingers. Have, have you? Ryan sighed. Now it was his turn to feel uncomfortable. An idea crossed my mind, he admitted. Did your father ever use his power on you? I. I don't think so. I, if he had, I wouldn't be here. I would have become him. He could have done something more subtle. Closed your wounds, perhaps? Why are you asking me this? Len asked, her smile gone. You remember when you took your elixir? She nodded slowly in response. Your father instantly knew you had done so. At first, I thought it was because he could sense blood and manipulate it from afar, but what if he had left a trace of himself inside you? Like a, blood beacon? You were his cherished daughter, his only reason to live, Ryan said with a frown. He always managed to find us when we wandered off. Len's worried face told the courier she considered it a strong possibility. You think, you think that's what Dynamis is after? Something he left behind? It's possible. I will need a blood sample to check, and the tools in the back of my car. What about the knockoffs? Len asked suddenly. You, you studied elixirs, right? Didn't you, didn't you notice a match? How? The carnival made sure to erase any trace of your father specifically to prevent him from returning. I had nothing to compare the knockoffs to. Until now, Len frowned. Riri, if there is a match. I know, Ryan sighed. But can we focus on the brain transfer project first? 
I, it's dangerous, Len. It might take me more than one run to get into Dynami's labs, and I don't want you to forget me again. I. I will do what I can. Len cleared her throat. But there's, there's something missing. Something is wrong. Of course. There was always a new roadblock to overcome, but Ryan remained an optimist. The tech doesn't work? It does, she replied, pointing at the brain scanning helmet. It can make a brain map and create a, a computer simulation. I can then send it, send it to a host, to overwrite the previous cognitive system. The closer the host's nervous system to the simulation, the better. Otherwise, the host brain will degrade. Conflicting memories, confused neurons. But if we send your memories to your past self, then there shouldn't be any problem, right? Ryan asked. It should be fine. Maybe a harmless concussion, maybe nothing. Len crossed her arms. Should work even wirelessly, when I'm done. Then where's the catch? To wirelessly send the memories to a host through time, you need, Len struggled to find the right words. You need more power. More power than any natural energy source can provide. Ryan quickly caught on. Like Violet Flux? Yes. I think. I think we can only send signals, let alone the brain map, back in time if we hook the Krona radio to Vulcan's armor. But, Ryan immediately noticed the problem. That wasn't the case in the previous run. The Krona radio was destroyed, and Jasmine and I created the armor afterward. Yet we still received future recordings. Yes, Len nodded slowly. I. I don't think I sent the Krona radio messages, Riri. Or at least, not the previous me. It, it could have been a future me. That's not how time works, unless I have been wrong about everything, Ryan replied, scratching his hair. Only two time periods could exist through his save point. It has to be something else. All the messages revolved around our interactions during the previous loop. Then, who sent the messages? Ryan tried to remember the end of the previous run, and his trip to the purple world. The visions he had seen, and the colossal entity he briefly made contact with near the end. The ultimate ones are compassionate, though narrow-minded. And the Krona radio message happened right when Ryan seriously considered giving up. Not who, the time traveler realized. What? Ryan looked at Eugene Henry, as a few things fell into place. The cat had somehow gained powers across time, deliberately led Livia to the courier, and then appeared in the Kami cave right when Len considered studying Violet Flux for her experiment. Far too many coincidences at once. You aren't teleporting at random at all, the courier accused Eugene Henry. You're being teleported by something else. Something showing us the way, telling us we can succeed if we work hard enough. The cat meowed in response. Riri, you, you're talking to a cat. It makes sense in the context, Ryan defended himself, while Eugene Henry licked his own shoulder. You remember what I told you, Shorty? About what I saw in the purple world? She quickly connected the dots. You think the pyramid thing is, what, helping us? The courier nodded, leaving Eugene Henry to his cleaning. I'm starting to wonder if these visions, the Krona radio signals, and Eugene Henry's teleportations are truly random events, or an attempt at communication. That sounds, Len tried to find the right words. I dunno, a bit far-fetched. And if it's as powerful as you think it is, why do so little? Why only teleport a cat around, of all things? Why would it even care? I dunno, Ryan admitted. It's just a theory. But I find all these strange coincidences oddly convenient, and I'm convinced the people I saw in my vision are either the alchemist or connected to them. You saw a base in Antarctica, right? Len asked. Could you identify where exactly? Maybe, Ryan replied. I have only seen the night sky, not enough to pinpoint the exact position, but at least we can narrow it down. We could visit that base, she suggested. With the submarine. Check, after, after we're done with the rest here. The rest. Such an understatement. I guess I better work on that heist then, Ryan said. Since Len kept the car, and they weren't even married, 
Ryan had to use a bathysphere to reach the surface, and then called a taxi to get to his destination. A taxi. Is this karma for leaving my car to die? Ryan wondered out loud, as he stepped out of the taxi and right in front of a Dynami-zoned hospital, the same one where Psyshock's victims had been brought to during the courier's first IL Miglior loop. Private security members protected the building from intruders, but much to Ryan's surprise, no journalists waited at the entrance. Either Dynamis kept the patient's identity strictly confidential, or all media were in the company's pocket. Probably both. As he made his way towards the entrance, Ryan quickly noticed a familiar face leaving the hospital and climbing at the back of a Mercedes-Benz. A young teenager with short brown hair, blue eyes, and a heart-shaped face. Narcinia. As for her chauffeur, Ryan recognized him as Mortimer out of costume and with sunglasses. Though the courier only caught a glimpse of her, Felix's adoptive sister looked quite upset. He guessed her meeting with her brother hadn't gone well. The guards let Ryan in after a quick security check, and the courier found wardrobe and the panda waiting for him in the entrance hall. The former was talking with an unknown woman, and the latter texted on his phone with tears in his eyes. They had brought chocolate and flowers with Felix's name on them. Hi, Ryan. Wardrobe greeted the courier, though the panda was too focused on his task to notice. I'm so glad you could make it. Hi, Yuki, Ryan waved his hand at his favorite fashion designer, before glancing at the other woman in the room. She was in her early twenties, with shoulder-long brown hair and striking amber eyes, probably British too. Unlike the more feminine wardrobe, she wore a grey corporate suit, albeit one as stylish as Blackthorns. Hello, quick save, she said with a warm smile, offering him her hand to shake. Definitely British. I'm Nora, Nora Moore. Yuki spoke a lot about you. She's my girlfriend, wardrobe said with a smile. The architect. The pleasure is all mine, Ryan said, as he took Nora's hand and kissed it in the most gentlemanly way instead of shaking it. The woman blushed a little at the surprise attention, though the courier frowned at wardrobe next in displeasure. But she doesn't have a costume. I'm disappointed, Yuki. I know, wardrobe sighed. I tried. I can't wear a costume like yours at work, Nora replied with an embarrassed smile, before glancing at Ryan. I'm not a superhero, but an independent contractor and urban planner. I have a genius power specialized in cities and architecture. And she is amazing, wardrobe said with a bright smile. Come on, Nora, show him. Her girlfriend showed Ryan her tablet, which showed advanced plans of arcology-like, self-sustaining towns, a flying city, and even an underground bunker settlement. So you can make any kind of city, the courier asked, quite impressed with her work. He recognized most of the features thanks to his own knowledge, but Nora made excellent use of limited resources and for a fraction of the expected cost, from what I gather. How could you tell? Nora asked with a raised eyebrow. Well, you fully optimize the space, energy consumption, and material, Ryan said, pointing at various parts of the designs. Though I think you could move the generators closer to the water recycling for shorter heating circuits. Interesting idea, Nora said with a smile. Are you a genius too? Ryan is super duper smart, Yuki said doing the courier's publicity for him. You should see his car and weapons, it's a treasure trove. Unfortunately my Plymouth Fury is in a garage for now, Ryan said before returning the tablet. Do you plan to resettle areas destroyed by the genome wars? Some of your designs don't make sense otherwise. You're quite sharp, Nora replied with a nod. A lot of my projects were scrapped by the previous administration, but the new one seems more open-minded. It will be nice to design something other than fortress cities in Sicily. Have you ever wanted to build an underwater metropolis? Ryan asked, wondering if he should introduce her to Len. Because I know a genius specialized in sea-based technology. She's a Marxist-Leninist however. The idea of oceanic settlements crossed my mind, yes. I would be happy to meet with her, though considering her political leanings, it will be outside of Dynamis. Nora observed Ryan closely, a warm smile on her lips. Maybe we could discuss that in length another time? You seem quite knowledgeable about genius tech, and I would be delighted to exchange with you further. 
The way she looked at him made Ryan realize that he really had a thing for female geniuses, even when they played for the other team. Tell me, did you design the Dynamis HQ and Optimates Tower? He asked the architect. I think I recognized your style from the plans. I did, yes, it was one of my earliest work, so I'm not all that proud of it. Why? Nothing, Ryan replied innocently, a sinister plan forming in his mind. Also, I apologize. For what? The architect asked with a raised eyebrow. I know everyone does that, but I shamelessly flirted with wardrobe before I knew of your existence, Ryan apologized, making Yuki all flustered. I hope you don't hate me for it. She really deserved it. Oh, that? Nora exploded into laughter. It's fine. I really like the bunny costume you made for her actually, we'll make good use of it. I'm sorry, Ryan, would totally date you both at once if I could, Wardrobe said with a sorry face. It's an exclusive contract. Civil union and all. Yes, I'm afraid so, Nora said with a coy smile. But I will give you my blessing to send Yuki an application if we end up breaking up. You seem like a nice person. But if I wasn't with Nora, I would wear your bunny costume, force you into a Hugh Hefner one, and we would make love everywhere in my condo. Yuki told Ryan with a wink. I like beautiful people. Men, women, it doesn't matter, so long as they dress well and are beautiful inside too. And you're beautiful everywhere, Ryan. Thanks, the courier replied, happy to keep such a cultured, gentle soul as a friend. He would make sure they got to hang out together during his perfect run. Also Ryan, I imagined a new costume for you. Wardrobe said while grabbing the tablet and opening a new file. I was so, so sad when I learned you would leave the team, I had to make a new one. We can still team up, Ryan said. Like Batman and Superman. I'll be the grim vigilante, and you the law-abiding citizen. I've thought of that. Wardrobe presented him a sketch of the costume, all dark and edgy except for a silver lining on the chest. You've turned your back on the light and embraced the darkness, you've chosen to wear Karl Lagerfeld. No longer a villain, no longer a hero, but someone in the twilight. Yet the silver lining on your chest means that you're still looking for redemption. But it's still made of cashmere? Ryan asked, hopeful. Only the shirt beneath, hidden like your tortured soul, wardrobe continued, the jacket will be made of guanaco. Pure genius. Ryan then glanced at the panda, who hadn't left his seat yet. Is that any way to greet your sensei, arrogant young disciple? When the young hero looked up at his master, it was with tears. I'm sorry, Sifu, he said, holding his phone with his tiny human hands. I just. I just can't. He showed Ryan his cell phone, and the website he had been browsing. Pandamania, the courier asked upon reading the name out loud. The landing page represented his animal friend with a cape and a lightning hammer, with the panda's true power written below. It's a meme, his young and naive disciple said, with tears in his eyes. A meme site. I have memes. He is a hit on the Dynanet and our social networks, Nora explained. His first merchandise sold incredibly well, almost as much as all other new recruits combined. Ryan could see why. It seemed the Dynanet users loved exalting the panda as an unstoppable badass, photoshopping pictures of him in place of action movie stars. The panda is the key to everything. Panda OP, please nerf. One just does not say no to a panda, the panda didn't take a second elixir to give Augustus a fighting chance, and so on. I'm famous. The panda wiped away a tear. Everyone thinks I'm amazing and strong. You deserved it, Wardrobe patted him on the shoulder with a smile. You were so brave fighting the metagang, I thought you stole everyone's spotlight. Yes, young disciple, here is the reward for your hard work, Ryan said, trying to imitate a wise elder's voice, but this is only the first step towards ascension. Many roadblocks await you. Thank you Sifu. I wouldn't be here if you hadn't believed in me. You, the panda couldn't prevent himself from crying. You are my friend. Hug me, you stupid man bear. And so they did. Tightly. He felt so warm and furry to the touch, even while in human form. 
Wardrobe looked at them for a moment and then joined in, while her girlfriend looked on with amusement. Eventually, a nurse came for them. Mr. Varen will receive you now. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to The Perfect Run. Chapter 66, The Hit. So you say the high security labs are so reinforced, they would survive missile strikes? Ryan asked Nora as the group walked through the hospital's hallway, guided by the Dynamis nurse. The hummed a song to himself, while wardrobe carried flowers and chocolates in her arms. Yes, the tinted glass windows outside are just for show, the architect explained. Separate energy generators keep the whole floor running without any external help needed, and the alarm system can detect any intruder. And there is only one way in, through the elevator and then a blast door. No emergency exit? Ryan asked, realizing his options to infiltrate the lab unnoticed had greatly narrowed. Not to criticize you, but it sounds like an oversight to me. What if there's a nuclear detonation inside? Bite me, Mr. Manada wanted the place to be secure, not safe, Nora replied with a smile. I suppose they experiment with dangerous creatures and they don't want to take any chance of them escaping. I mean, have you seen what they use at the Colosseum Maximus? I just love the new Cyberdurano design. Wardrobe commented. Especially the holographic goggles, very classy. Oh, about that, people asked the to participate in the new tournament's opening match. Ryan's disciple showed off his chest with pride. Panda vs Velociraptors, the ultimate showdown. If you ask me, it's a colossal waste of resources. Nora rolled her eyes. The money would be better spent on hospitals than dinosaurs. They cost a fortune to make, let alone feed. Frankly, I'm torn, Ryan admitted. I understand where you come from, but dinosaurs have a special mass appeal. Though if someone were to blow up the whole building because they're too lazy to use the stairs, would the labs remain intact? Well, yes, they would. Nora looked at Ryan strangely. Why would terrorists be too lazy to use the stairs? It's purely hypothetical, Ryan lied through his teeth. But that's good to know. Eventually, the nurse led them to a white hospital room, or as Ryan called it, Felix's litter. The young hero looked far better than a few days ago, when acid rain had stabbed him through the gut. Besides the fact he needed to stay in bed with bandages around his chest, Adam Cat looked almost perfectly healthy. Though he had been forced to trade his hideous suit and mask for white hospital clothes, which Ryan considered an improvement. No wonder Livia fell for a face like that, Ryan thought, as he observed Felix's adorable visage. However, he soon remembered what Fortuna had said, about how her mother used her power for aesthetic surgery. Did Venus do the same with her son? Now that Ryan thought of it, Adam Cat's facial features seemed a bit too perfect. Poor kitten. Even his face wasn't his own. Guys, Felix said, unsurprised by Nora's presence. Wardrobe probably introduced them to one another in the past. Felix, I'm so glad you're okay. Wardrobe immediately all but dumped the chocolates and flowers on the patient's lap, much to his shock. Did they treat you well? Of course, the Dynamis nurse said with an amused smile, before closing the door behind them, I will leave you alone, but please don't make too much noise. The other patients need rest. The scratched the back of his head, a bit confused. I thought you shared a room with, the glass guy. Translucent, Ryan said. Or semi-transparent for friends. The shroud, Felix replied. He was transferred to intensive care after some shrapnel hit his vital organs. His injuries were so severe, they had to put him in an artificial coma. This bothered Ryan. Though Matty Boy had killed him a few times, the time traveler had grown to appreciate the vigilante. The transparent hero had provided a lot of help across the loops, and without his assistance, Big Fat Adam might have gotten his hands on the Bahamut by now. Will he survive? Wardrobe asked, her expression deflating. Adam Cat shook his head, unable to answer. It is my fault. I should have thought of a better persona. You couldn't know, Yuki, Nora reassured her. It was in the heat of battle. No one will blame you for losing your cool. You saved my life with your nurse cosplay, Felix pointed out. The fashion designer didn't look convinced. 
Yes, but. I've done some research, and there are a few personas I could have used to save you both. Though I wish white mages were public domain. It was your first time in that situation, right? Ryan asked Wardrobe, who nodded slowly. Nobody can blame you for not being perfect on your first try. Believe me, I know. Practice makes perfect. His words were meant to encourage Wardrobe, but they worsened her mood further. I don't want to practice watching people die, she said, holding her arms as if to protect herself. The architect put a comforting hand on her girlfriend's shoulder, trying to reassure Wardrobe. So, um, Felix, when will you be out? The attempted to change the subject. Tomorrow, but I won't stay with Ayel Miglior, Felix said, before dropping the bomb. I'm joining the carnival. What? The news was enough to draw Wardrobe out of her depressed mood. No way, quick save the pandas only had one successful outing and you're all leaving? That's like breaking the band after a hit song. We can form a duo, Yuki, said the trying to salvage the brand. Ian and Yang. If you change your hero name to Circus Lion, I'll disown you, Ryan warned Adam Cat. Felix ignored the courier's jab, and seemed quite uncomfortable in his presence. Something had changed. Is this about the costume? Wardrobe asked Felix with a frown. Because Enrique won't let you join the Pro League unless you change your outfit? Wearing what I want is just a bonus, Felix said with a smirk. Sorry, but I feel more in line with the carnival's values than I.L. Migliore's. Too much red tape gets in the way of doing what's right. Ryan couldn't say he was surprised, but he wondered how Lightning Dad would react. Mob Zeus could barely be talked out of murdering his godson for joining Dynamis, joining Sunshine's team might very well push the aging psychopath over the edge. Come to think of it, both Lucky Girl and Livia had been strangely silent lately, neither sending messages. A storm was brewing in the background. Ryan could feel it in his bones. I feel so sad about this, Wardrobe lamented. We could have done wonders, the four of us. We can still team up from time to time, Ryan argued. A crossover event every month, until our fans get sick of it. Yes, but it's not the same, the fashion designer replied. I really liked hanging out with all of you. You could always form your own group, Nora suggested. I think Enrique would be open to the idea. I'll pass, Ryan replied. I don't think I will stay in New Rome for long. Really? This time, Felix finally paid attention to him. Where will you go? Where life will carry me. In truth, Ryan had no idea what would happen after he achieved his perfect run for New Rome. In the best case scenario, he might stay with Len and the children, but the time traveler would likely go back to the road. Staying in one place made him restless, and he couldn't live without seeking new adventures to tackle. The courier didn't feel at home anywhere. Sifu, are you leaving me alone? Even though he was in human form, the panda's expression remained very bear-like. Your training is now complete, young disciple, Ryan said, trying to sound wise. From now on, life will be your teacher. I. I understand, the poor man bear struggled not to cry. I understand. I know you have a lone cowboy energy about you, Wardrobe said with a frown. But. I dunno, that sounds like a very lonely existence, Ryan. You're sure you don't want to stay? Even if Dynamis doesn't want you anymore, I sure do. Ryan looked at this pure, sweet creature too good for this broken earth. BFF? BFF, she replied with a warm smile. Unfortunately, you might have to discuss Yuki's better qualities later, Nora said as she checked the time. You will be late for the meeting. You have something planned? Ryan asked the others, uninformed. Wyvern wants every IL Miglior member to join a big meeting, Wardrobe said with a sad face. Sorry, Ryan, it's members only. I really argued for you to be present, but the new CEO said no. But we'll tell you how it went. It didn't take long for Ryan to put the pieces together, but he kept his thoughts to himself. Well, I'll change the kitten's litter alone then. Oh, we could meet tomorrow at my place. The suggested. It's small, but it's comfy. 
Sure, that would be great, Nora said with a smile as she turned to face Ryan. Perhaps you could introduce me to that underwater specialist you told me about? Ryan chuckled. I'm not sure if she will agree to leave the Kami cave, but I'll try to convince her. Ooh, maybe I will get the Karl Marx costume out of storage then. On these words, Wardrobe apologized to Felix for the short visit, and then left alongside her girlfriend and the Ryan was left alone with the young superhero. Dynamis and the Carnival are planning to attack the Augusti, aren't they? Ryan asked Felix once the rest of the group had left. A meeting that involves all heroes in their employ barely two days after the Rust Town raid. Alphonse Manada and Hargraves want to strike the iron while it's still hot. Do you want to know? Felix asked, his tone suddenly caged and wary. Or is it Livia asking through you? Truthfully, kitten, I will find out soon anyway, Ryan replied with a shrug. I'm just trying to make conversation. Also, I thought you didn't want family visits, but I've seen Narcinia leaving this place. I made an exception for Narcinia. She deserved to know the truth. Well, that explained her reaction. I told her everything. How Augustus murdered her parents, and arranged her adoption so he could use her powers to make drugs. It makes me sick just to speak of it. He's even worse than I thought. I assume she didn't believe you. Ryan slouched on the nearest chair, a leg over the armrest. She has no memories of her birth parents? No, Felix replied with an angry scowl. Bacchus probably shattered her mind when she was young. He can do that with his power. Psychically torture people to madness, or gaslight them into believing false things. Ryan mentally noted that tidbit of information, to use when he would blow up the Bliss Factory later. Well, if you truly join the carnival, you will have the opportunity to contribute to the family feud. I know about Livia. Felix glared at Ryan. Blackthorn told me you met with her and Fortuna. Well, that explained the sudden distance between them. If I told you it was part of a master plan to get your sister off my back, would you believe me? I know how she is, but Livia? Felix crossed his arms. First my sister, now my ex. You had to fuck the whole family? Are your parents in an open marriage? Ryan asked innocently. Adam Cat didn't find him funny. Are you in bed with them? The Augusti? Figuratively or literally? Technically, he did sleep with Jasmine, but that was one loop ago. Because the answer is no for both. I swear I haven't touched your sister, though her power doesn't make it easy. She's not as bad as I thought, however. Just, stop talking about my sister, Felix closed his eyes for a second, as if he banished a dirty image in his own mind. Livia is too careful to approach someone outside the hierarchy. Even with Fortuna around. And that's not all. You knew that Fortuna was my sister and that I dated Livia, information only available among the Augusti and a few people at Dynamis. Blackthorn swears you never talked about me before. Ryan guessed where this was going. You think I got this information from the Augusti, kitten? Where else? Felix replied sarcastically. I just don't get you, Ryan. Would I have helped Translucent and Sunshine if I worked with Augustus? Ryan asked a simple question, glancing at the chocolates wardrobe had left to Felix. He had the feeling they would go uneaten. I can't help it if everyone wants a piece of me. So you're not a friend of Augustus, but you're not his enemy either? Felix sneered, his former friendliness gone. So, you're just a mercenary at heart? You organized the metagang's downfall because someone paid you to? What? No, I'm not paid for what I do though I wish I were. Good grief, if Ryan had been paid for every loop he spent in New Rome, he would be even richer. Truth is, kitten, I destroyed Hanifat Lecter's group because they threatened friends of mine. I'm just trying to make sure the people I care about get to live another day. No more, no less. That's Livia's excuse. Protect her family, no matter what. She still loves you, you know? While Ryan respected Felix's decision to cut ties with his family, he sympathized too much with Livia's situation not to at least try to help them make up. I don't. Adam Kitten looked away. I never did. Not like that. Ryan frowned. 
What do you mean? Our parents pushed us into our relationship, Felix admitted. They were best friends back when their organization was just a branch of the Kimura. Our match was decided back when we were children. I. I still care about her, don't get me wrong, but as a friend. I don't love her. I never was the Prince Charming she wanted me to be. She told me about your secret hideout. Ryan tried to sound neutral, but he couldn't hold back an undercurrent of reproach in his voice. How you went there to hide from your families. You were misleading her back then? I. I wasn't lying, not really. I tried to make it work, but, Adam Kitten shook his head. You can't force yourself to love someone, man. Ryan felt some sympathy for Felix, but he pitied Livia most of all. Longing for something that was never there. Most of all though, the courier couldn't shake the feeling this situation echoed his own. He saw the parallels with his relationship with Len painted all over the walls, though at least he and Shorty might end up on speaking terms. Livia and Felix's situation just reeked of a tragedy waiting to happen. You're close to her, Felix said. Livia. She told you about the hideout. About me. That's how you knew. You're not Augusta's friend, you're Livia's. I wouldn't go that far. We threatened to kill each other more than once. Still, Blackthorn told me you were pretty friendly to each other. Felix examined Ryan closely, his face undecipherable. What is she to you? I, Ryan cleared his throat, trying to organize his thoughts. She, she reminds me of someone else. Someone I tried to free from a monster, and I failed. I just don't want Livia to end the same way. Adam Cat remained silent for an agonizing minute, before speaking his mind, you won't save her from her father, Ryan. The courier flinched. I tried too, Felix said. But you can't. His hold over her is too strong. The only way is to destroy Augustus, and even if you can, she will hate you for it. Just like Len and Bloodstream. Isn't that what you're trying to do? Ryan asked. Dynamis and the carnival plan to attack Augustus, and Lightning but won't take you siding with them well. Your parents can't shield you forever. I don't care, Felix replied, raising his shoulder in an attempt to look stronger than he was. I made peace with the possibility. With Sunshine's help, the Monada might have the firepower to take down the Augusti, Ryan conceded. But the real problem remains. Mob Zeus himself. Dynamis has a weapon. Something that might put him out of commission. The gravity gun Alphonse mentioned earlier? His own father didn't believe in it. We can't live in fear of him forever, Ryan, Felix replied gruffly. Someone has to take a stand, even if they must pay the price. Or else, things will never change. Bliss will continue to flow, and people will keep dying. Ryan prepared to argue with him further, when his phone rang. He quickly brought it out of his pocket and checked the sender. It's Livia, he said. Felix responded with a scoff. Don't answer. I won't take the phone. Okay boomer, Ryan replied before taking the call anyway. Yes, princess. Ryan. Her tone was frantic, almost panicked. Is Felix with you? Yes, but he won't speak with you. You need to run, she interrupted him, you need to take him and run. You need to get out of New Rome right now. Wait, wait, out of New Rome? Ryan frowned, straightening in his chair. Princess, I have a life, I can't drop everything to Dash. If you don't, Dad will have him killed. Ryan froze in place, looking at the oblivious Adam Kitten. Because he joined the carnival? And what he told Narcinia, Livia continued, her voice breaking. Though he couldn't hear her side of the conversation, Felix clearly seemed to understand the gist of it. I'm. I'm trying to prevent it, but the possibilities get worse every minute. I. I can't see a way out, but I can't see you either. I need your help. Should I bring him to Dynamis? No. My father is marshalling his forces for war with the Monada. Felix won't be safe anywhere in New Rome, do you understand? War. Ryan's worst fears were realized. 
either lightning but had learned of Sunshine's alliance with Dynamis or of their incoming attack, and gotten off his throne. The Living Sun and Augustus would soon settle their rivalry, one way or another. Ryan looked at Felix and considered his options. Technically, besides Lab 66, nothing kept him in New Rome anymore in this run. Shorty wanted to abandon the surface altogether, and the carnival would probably make the Bliss Factory their first target. However, if the city descended into war, Ryan couldn't afford to miss it. Len might get embroiled in it, if he trusted Enrique's words, and too many people he wanted to protect were in danger. He needed to gather more information. Who is after him? The courier asked. Why can't he survive in any possibility? Livia hesitated, but in the end, she wanted to protect Felix more than she wished to hide her family's secrets. Aunt Pluto, she finally admitted. Aunt Pluto will go after him. Cruella. They sent Cruella. If she gets to him, it's over Ryan. She already marked him. And Ryan too, beforehand. If she gets close enough, he will die with no way out. He has to leave the city. How does Pluto's power work? The mere mention of her name caused a silent Felix to tense up. She, she can mark people with a curse, and the closer she moves to them, the closer they become to death. Ryan, you must leave now. She will be on her way anytime soon. Ryan observed Adam Cat, who seemed, almost resigned. Like a condemned man hearing a death sentence. He didn't think he would survive this. Now, Ryan could leave him to his death. Pluto might be one of the few people capable of killing him permanently, and he was making real progress with breaking his own curse. Len was on the verge of unlocking the brain transfer, and they could sit out this war. Livia would be mad but Ryan could reasonably escape any punishment if he played his cards well. But that would mean callously leaving a teammate to die for his personal gain. And even if there might be no punishment. Ryan wasn't that kind of person. You were on my list too, the courier finally told Felix, remembering his discussion with Livia earlier during this loop. She had claimed you first, so I didn't say your name. Adam Cat blinked in confusion. What? The list of people I wished to protect. Well, that left only one option then. Kitten, pack your things, we're going to Monaco. Monaco? Felix asked, horrified. I'm kidding, Ryan said, his phone still in hand. About the Monaco part. Pack your things, we're leaving. I'm not running away, not even from Pluto, Adam Kitten insisted. I won't hide. Let me tell you something. The time traveler put away the phone, looking straight into Felix's eyes. Death is painful. It is painful, and lonely, and you have no idea how much. And not just for you, but for everyone who cared about you. If you want to die a martyr? Fine, it's your choice. But do you imagine how your sisters will feel? How will your friends? But. How do you think Fortuna will feel once Pluto brings her your head? This time, Ryan's blunt question silenced the young hero. Unlike the courier, Felix had people who would mourn his death, people who would remember. And it seemed he had finally realized it. We're leaving, Ryan told Livia, Felix climbing out of the bed to change his clothes. How long do we have? I'll try to give you as much as possible, but, not much. She let out a long sigh. Thanks, Ryan. I. I will remember this. You aren't helping an ingrate, I swear. You won't remember, but thanks anyway. Ryan hung up, and called another number. Shorty? Shorty? Yes, she answered. Thankfully, she had set up a communication channel for such emergencies. Is there a problem? Yes, a big one. Could you reroute one of your bathospheres to send a human-sized cat to say, France? What's, what's happening? She immediately started to panic. Riri, are they hunting you? No, not yet. Though Ryan had the intuition he would be on Augustus' kill list very soon. It's for a friend in need. I. I can do it. Okay, we'll meet outside the city. 
If the transfer happened within New Rome's confines and they learned of the bathysphere, then Vulcan would either track Felix down or inform Augustus about Len's hideout. While the weapon genius wasn't very loyal to her boss, she had no reason to help Ryan this time around. Be wary, Vulcan might be set on our case soon. From the designs I gave you, how long will it take you to recreate the armor? Riri, we can't, it's too early to test. I'm not even sure. We won't have much time, Ryan replied. The whole cardboard castle will crumble soon. The storm Enrique had forewarned was about to hit New Rome. And Ryan wanted Len to remember him when it subsided. I. I'll do what I can, she said. Take care, Riri. I'm coming. Thanks, Ryan said as he hung up. By now, Adam Cat had switched from his hospital clothes to his usual costume, and even put the mask on. Why France? Felix asked, a dart bandolier around his chest. Many people there owe me a favor, and I'll cash in. Ryan's first thought had been to send Adam Cat to Len's base, but the risk of Augustus attacking the Kami cave was too great. The courier couldn't endanger Short you nor the children. I hope you like Camus though. Whom? What an uncultured boar. Do we take your car? The, damn it, and this mess had to happen the one day he left his Plymouth Fury with Len. No, Ryan said, realizing he would need to cross a line today. We'll take the Panda Mobile. He had the feeling this day was about to get worse. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to The Perfect Run. Chapter 67, Murphy's Law. The Panda Mobile was, well, everything Ryan had expected. A Dynamis made copy of a second generation Fiat covered in white and black fur to mimic an actual it was comfy and cute, with a doll dangling from the rear view mirror. A complete lack of imagination packaged by a corporation too lazy to make a custom car. If they hadn't given him the keys beforehand, Ryan wouldn't have touched the thing with a nine foot pole. And even then, just putting his hands on the driving wheel felt wrong. I feel like I'm cheating on my long-suffering wife with a dirty whore, Ryan said, thinking fondly of his Plymouth Fury. I'm filled with regrets. Regrets and anguish. Shut up and keep driving, Adam Katz said from the front seat, repeatedly looking in the rearview mirror for any sign of Pluto. The duo had reached the city's suburbs, and would soon approach an overpass. Great pillars of concrete lifted the highway out of New Rome above the road like a bridge, and loomed over shacks inhabited by the city's poorest residents. While Dynamis had put some effort into keeping the highway functional, they clearly didn't look below it. Still, the sun was starting to set, and no sign of the Augusti yet. If all went well, the duo should reach the rendezvous point with Len near the Amalfi coast at nightfall. Hey, you're the one who prevented us from taking a better car. Upon seeing the abomination, Ryan had immediately tried to borrow the nearest sports car, but no, Kitten was too nice to allow it. It's your life on the line. One of them anyway. Yours too now. Augustus will target anyone who helps me. Felix sighed. Sorry to be snappy, Ryan. I appreciate the help. Have you fallen for me yet? The courier teased him, just as his phone started ringing. Lucky girl. Because your sister has, in spite of my best efforts. You shouldn't be calling while driving, Adam Katz said gruffly, as Ryan picked up the phone while driving towards a traffic light. Fortuna, darling, how can I make you even happier today? Ryan? Much to his surprise, she seemed confused to have the handsome courier on the phone. How can it be, I was trying to call Felix. My power is never wrong. Well your wish has come true, Ryan said, while Felix shook his head like a maniac, he is right next to me, begging me for protection. He is? Fortuna asked while her brother glared at the courier. Oh my Ryan, you truly are the perfect gentleman, anticipating my wishes before I even think of them. Now, hand him the phone. I don't want it, Felix said, as Ryan dangled the cell phone right in front of his partner's head. Come on, don't be a bab. The traffic light above them separated from the pole holding it above the ground, and threatened to fall on the Panda Mobile. Ryan activated his power, looked out of the window, and then skillfully drove out of the object's way when time resumed. The traffic light crashed on the ground and shattered into pieces. 
Sheesh, what happened to public service, the violet genome asked, before shoving the phone against Felix's ear. Stop, the hero complained, until he heard Fortuna berating him on the other end. Yes, Fortuna, I'm alive. No, I can't tell you where I am. Ryan tried to relax, but didn't have the time to as he noticed a car coming from his right. The courier had to veer at the last second to dodge the incoming maniac. Does everyone in this town drive like crazy? Ryan complained. New Rome's traffic killed him twice on his first day. At least I can stop time. Adam Cat tensed up. It wasn't an accident, he said, pushing the phone away. Can you feel it? The cold? What cold? It's her. Ryan looked at the rearview mirror, but didn't notice anything extraordinary. How far does her range extend? I don't know, but if I can feel the effects, then she can track me. Damn it. Milady, the courier said, as he recovered the phone, I'll call you back. Don't you dare hang up on me again, Ryan, the courier hung up on Fortuna, putting his phone back under his suit, and took a turn towards the highway. Soon, the Panda Mobile climbed on the giant highway and left New Rome entirely. The enormous road, lifted by pillars, oversaw the lush countryside around the city. The urban jungle was replaced with woods, country roads, and isolated houses. Besides a few diesel vehicles, Ryan had the road to himself. Kitten, you're sure she can track people down with her power? After all, Pluto didn't notice that she had marked Ryan until they met in a previous loop. Yes, Felix said, repeatedly glancing at the rearview mirror. Once she marks a target and activates her curse, it creates a sympathetic link between them. And the closer she is to her victim, the stronger her power is. I don't know everything about her ability, but I learned that at least. If Pluto's range extended so far they couldn't even see her, and if she could truly sense her targets, then they had no way to surprise her. Felix looked through his window, and gasped in surprise. There. Ryan froze time, and looked through Adam Cat's window. A familiar black Lamborghini moved on the road below the highway, between the woods. A few hundred meters away from the Panda Mobile. Worse, two people on a motorcycle escorted the car. The driver was a gaunt, masculine figure entirely dressed in a black bodysuit covering him from head to toe. The other was a woman in a red leather jacket, her crimson hair flowing out of her biker helmet, she was carrying a submachine gun. The road they followed led back to the highway, at a junction roughly a kilometer ahead. Kitten, put on your belt, we're gonna rock, Ryan warned as time resumed. The courier smashed the accelerator, and the Panda Mobile moved faster and faster. With luck, they would reach their maximum speed and beat their pursuers to the road junction. The vamp, and night terror, Felix said before looking at the speedometer, as it climbed to 120 and kept rising. Can this car go faster than a Lamborghini? Now, kitten, don't be stupid. Pluto was driving a Lamborghini Gallardo, which could go twice as fast as the Panda Mobile. That Dynami's abomination could reach 150 km per hour maximum. Night Terror, you said? I think I heard that name before. The blue genome of the Killer 7. I don't know what his power does, except it activates in the darkness. Oh, so during the night? Ryan was glad some of the Killer 7 used appropriate names themed after their abilities. And the Vamp? She sucks you dry? Not really, she can use pheromones to make people do stupid things, and even kill them on touch. I should have known they would send the one genome I couldn't blow up through direct contact. Adam Cat looked through the window and ground his teeth. They're accelerating. They know we noticed them. Thankfully, the Panda Mobile passed the road junction first, and had now reached its maximum speed. However, when Ryan looked into his rearview mirror, he noticed the black Lamborghini and its escort pursuing them. Pluto had engaged Ryan in a highway car chase. She had no idea who she was dealing with. Go get him, Tiger. With pleasure. Felix opened his window, and threw an explosive dart at their pursuers with insane dexterity. Though Night Terror's motorcycle dodged the attack, the projectile exploded right in front of the Lamborghini in a catastrophic blast and blew dust everywhere. A truck next to the Panda Mobile suddenly veered off course, 
one of its wheels breaking down. Thanks to skills honed through countless stunts across his loops and selective use of his time stop, the courier managed to dodge the vehicle as it fell off the highway. No reincarnations today. Ryan mocked the truck, though he immediately had to avoid a pickup next. From what he saw, it suffered from the same problem as the previous vehicle. Ryan had a nasty gut feeling, and checked on the various parts of the Panda Mobile. He quickly realized their car hadn't been spared either. Oh great, the brakes don't work anymore. Not that I ever needed them before, but... It will become worse, the closer she gets, Felix warned, as Pluto's Lamborghini emerged from the dust cloud unharmed. The vamp, meanwhile, raised her submachine gun at the Panda Mobile. Get down. Ryan didn't need a warning. He and Felix lowered their heads, as a volley of bullets shattered the windows at the back of the Panda Mobile and impacted the windshield. One of the glass shards deviated from its natural course and aimed straight at Adam Cat's throat. The courier stopped time, grabbed the projectile, and threw it out of the car once time resumed. Does Pluto have any weaknesses? Ryan asked while looking at the road ahead. The sun was starting to vanish behind the horizon, and if Night Terror's power truly activated in the dark. I think she can only target one person at once, Felix said, throwing another dart at Night Terror's motorcycle. The assassin skillfully dodged the projectile, though at least it prevented his backup from aiming. From the glass shard incident, Ryan guessed Pluto directed her power at Adam Cat. Which would have been a great asset to counterattack, if the two heroes weren't in the same car. She needs physical proximity for the effect to get stronger, Adam Cat said, grabbing a new dart from his bandolier, so if we get far enough, it will lose potency. Maybe the brakes will work again then. What happens if she gets within say, 10 meters of us? Felix scowled. Heart attack. Ryan hoped it would take more than 40 seconds. Her power had to have a weakness. All yellow genomes had weird limits. They warped reality, transforming an imaginary concept or narrative into a physical law of the universe. They changed the very logic of the world. This world, Ryan muttered out loud. Pluto's power might make death an inevitable certainty for her victims, but the purple world belonged to the violet genome. Like how he ignored Fortuna's luck, the courier could break Pluto's hold on causality by stopping time selectively. Neither did Ryan think Pluto actually controlled the calamities she generated, or she would have caused their car to explode already. She was Fortuna's evil counterpart. She was. She's our final destination, said Ryan. I'm sorry? Felix asked, while Night Terror attempted to bridge the gap between their two vehicles and the vamp prepared a second volley. You never watched that movie? Ryan veered off to dodge a deer before it could hit the Panda Mobile. A deer. On a highway. Spoiler alert, the heroes live at the end. But they died in the sequel. He'd better not mention that. While Adam Cat's explosions prevented the vamp from aiming her submachine gun and forced Pluto's car to slow down to avoid getting blown up, Ryan could already see the consequences. The highway seemed to tremble, the structural damage from the explosions extrapolated by Cruella's own ability. Eventually, what was bound to happen, happened. One of the pillars holding the highway two dozen meters above the ground in front of the Panda Mobile collapsed, causing cars to fall to their doom. A large hole had formed between both halves of the road, one slightly higher than the other. Hold tight. Ryan said, the Panda Mobile now an unstoppable missile. The side of the road was located slightly higher than the other side, so they had a chance to make it. I got this. You're sure? Adam Cat panicked, as he quickly put on his belt. I couldn't slow down even if I wanted to. Ryan froze time for a few seconds to calculate the right angle, and then made the jump when it resumed. Like the majestic beast it took inspiration from, the Panda Mobile soared through the air with grace and dignity. The vehicle crossed the hole at full speed, Ryan adjusting its movement slightly to make the perfect landing. He then took a strong, confident pose, because when you made such a brave jump, you had to look the part too. And then came the moment of truth. The Panda Mobile landed with a loud thump, Felix almost jumping from his seat as the vehicle continued its course. Ryan heard the sound of the wheel straining from the impact, realizing they might flatten soon. 
Night Terror, that coward, chickened out and abruptly stopped his motorcycle within a few inches of the hole, much to the vamp's chagrin. The Lamborghini Gallardo though, kept accelerating. The car soared through the air like the Panda Mobile and made the jump, while Night Terror turned his bike around to find another way. Unfortunately, while Ryan was undoubtedly the most experienced driver in the world, Pluto's car could go twice as fast as his own. The Lamborghini started to gain ground, from 300 meters to 200. A chill ran down Ryan's spine, like the hand of death crawling on his back. His heartbeat accelerated, his breathing grew a little shorter. The courier felt like a rabbit hearing the faint steps of a predator nearby. His vision started to blur at the edges, his fingers twitched, and he heard his own heartbeat in his skull. Pluto's evil eye was on him now. Hit her, he snarled at Felix, Pluto's power making him unnaturally anxious. Hit her, hit her. I'm trying. Felix panicked, removing his seatbelt and struggling to find a new projectile. And I'm running out of darts. In which case? Kitten, hold the driving wheel. What? Felix hastily grabbed the wheel as Ryan kicked his door open, grabbing a revolver from under his suit. Then, as his cat struggled to keep the Panda Mobile on track, the courier rose half out of the car. Didn't you hear? Ryan shouted to Pluto, as he froze time and aimed at the Lamborghini. I'm immortal. He fired multiple shots, two at the windshield, one at the engine, and two at the wheels. Almost all of them bounced off. A bulletproof car? Ryan raged as time resumed, as he took back the driving wheel and closed his door. They have bulletproof cars, and we have a Fiat Panda. Worse, the Panda Mobile's car hood let out a puff of smoke, a flame rising from below. The calamities had started targeting the engine. Leave me and run. Felix shouted, as he found the only item left to throw, the doll dangling from the rearview mirror. He grabbed it and prepared to throw this lethal projectile like a grenade. They're only after me. No way, let me think. Ryan snarled, his breathing getting shorter, his body colder. The sun had now set, night ruled supreme, and the enemy car was now within 100 meters. Let me think, I can figure. Chasere. Ryan froze in fear, as he recognized the voice coming from his back. He didn't even dare look behind himself. He looked into the rear view, and he saw. It was dark outside, and Bloodstream sat at the back. He was exactly like in Ryan's memory, a monstrous, human-shaped blob of blood. And he remembered. You're dead, Ryan whispered, his voice breaking in primal fear. You're dead. Because you killed me. His arms lunged for Ryan's throat and started to choke him, like in his childhood. The courier lost his breath, and control of the driving wheel. Your own father. Ryan, what's happening? Felix panicked, as he abandoned his plan to throw the doll to regain control of the car. Unfortunately, he couldn't. Without the brakes, an intact engine, and a good driver, the Panda Mobile veered off course. The car crashed through the guardrail, and fell from the highway. Felix screamed in horror, as the Panda Mobile prepared to crash into the woods below. Ryan activated his time stop, the instinct of a dead man. Bloodstream's hold vanished along with his ghost, though the pain in the courier's neck didn't. The Panda Mobile had frozen a few meters above the ground, interrupting the fall. Working entirely on instinct, Ryan kicked the door of his car open and grabbed the time-frozen Felix. He leapt out of the car with his friend, both rolling on the soft grass a few meters away from their vehicle. When time resumed, the Panda Mobile hit the ground and exploded in a fiery detonation. Smoke and fumes rose from the wreck, illuminating the darkness. Bloodstream was nowhere to be found. He had never been there at all. An illusion, Ryan croaked, as he regained his breath and rose back to his feet. An illusion that could harm the target. Psychosomatic wounds? Night terror? No time. Felix said, pointing a finger at the highway above. The Lamborghini had stopped at the edge, Pluto and Sparrow stepping out of it to inspect the Panda Mobile's wreckage. Ryan and Felix immediately fled into the woods, just as Sparrow noticed them. The assassin unleashed a crimson beam from her vantage point and set a tree on fire, but the two heroes managed to escape into the darkness. 
The hunt had only started. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to The Perfect Run. Chapter 68, Death Stranding. From Friday the 13th to Candyman, Ryan had seen all the slasher movies. He had acted in a few too, either as the relentless Terminator during his brief Punisher phase, or as the lonely target pursued by malevolent psychos. He still looked back fondly on that run where he escaped the centipede with only his boxers on. Good times. So the current situation was nothing extraordinary. Night Terror was just Freddy Krueger, except he could attack people while they were awake. Pluto was death from final destination. The vamp was a trap, literal death by sex. As for Sparrow, she didn't fit any box. Perhaps she would be the final girl? The assassin was a bit old for the role, but Ryan was nothing if not open-minded. Anyway, he and Adam Cat had managed to escape through the woods, eventually moving far enough that Sparrow could no longer target them with lasers. The duo followed a hiking path down a wooded valley, surrounded by lush green ferns, verdant trees, orchids, and cascading water. Ryan recognized the area as the Valle del Ferriere, a natural reserve pre-war. Unfortunately, the courier sensed Pluto's power active on his person. His heartbeat raced unnaturally, his fingers twitched with tension, and he almost tripped on a rock at one point. They had put distance between the Augusti underboss and themselves, but she wouldn't relent. If we continue south, we should reach the rendezvous point with Shorty. Ryan checked his phone, trying to contact the Soviet Supreme without avail. Something is jamming my cell phone. Probably Vulcan's tech, Adam Cat said. Cut your phone off, they might be able to track it down. Good point, and it would spare Ryan more messages from Lucky Girl. How far do you think Night Pajamas range extends? I don't know, Adam Cat admitted, checking Ryan's neck. Red marks marred his skin where the bloodstream hallucination had choked him. Are you okay? I admit I was quite scared when I saw you freak out like a man possessed. Ah, he cared. Though after putting Ryan through such a scare, Night Pajama would suffer the Luigi treatment. Continue south, I will go east. You want us to split? That was a big no-no in slasher movies, but the courier was no helpless teenager. Cruella can only target one person at once, and she's focusing on me. I will lead her into a trap. If you escape, we've won. Also, Ryan couldn't risk having the Killer 7 track them to the rendezvous point. Risking his own life was one thing, endangering Lens was another. Felix immediately protested, I'm not leaving you to die, Ryan. Trust me, kitten, the courier said, while grabbing a revolver in each hand. He would have taken a dose of Rampage too, if he didn't worry Pluto's power might worsen the side effects. I do better without teams. But. Do I have to shoot you too? The kitten finally understood it was time to let the adults do their thing. Okay, Felix said, though he clearly didn't like it. Okay, I will trust you. But don't you dare die for me. God forbid, your sister would nag me in the afterlife if I did. Now go. With one last glance, Adam Kitten followed the hiking trail south, while the courier moved east. Ryan strolled through the woods, even as he sensed Pluto's invisible pressure growing stronger. He passed before the mossy ruins of houses and mills, and eventually followed a path following a tumbling river. He soon reached a wide area, with woods on one side, and a small waterfall on the other. A river coursed through a path of whetstone, which allowed one to step from one side to the other. Leaves bristled as shadows approached. Ryan raised his guns, as multiple figures seemed to surround him, with the darkness, he couldn't see clearly. And yet, as a sweet, delicious perfume filled the air, the courier couldn't help but relax. The tension in his body seemed to vanish, as an invisible voice told him to relax. Slowly, a figure emerged from the bushes, she was the most beautiful sight the courier had seen in his entire life, in all his runs combined. A gorgeous redhead with a curvaceous body, and perfect skin, even her few freckles only enhanced her appeal. Her lips were red as blood, her eyes shining emeralds. Her red jacket seemed like a forbidden frontier, the promise of untold pleasure to whoever could get past it. When he saw her, Ryan immediately wanted to drop everything, slam her against a tree, 
and give her the full Romano special. Hey, the vamp said with a warm, lovely smile, revealing her empty hands. Even her voice aroused the courier. It's okay. You're safe. My poor boy, you must have been so scared, all alone in the woods. Are you an angel? By now, Ryan's pop culture infested subconscious was in full control of his body. They're the most beautiful creatures in the universe. I can be your angel if you want, the redhead said, putting a hand on her jacket zipper. Just throw your weapons away, Anne. I'll show you heaven. Who was Jasmine again? This was the perfect waifu. The romance endgame, the true ending. But as Ryan was about to turn this horror movie into a porno, he realized one problem with this scenario. Gingers can't go to heaven, he said, they don't have souls. What? And then he shot her. The bullet impacted the killer's chest and tossed her back against a tree, but didn't shed blood. Oh, come on, what kind of supervillain wore a bulletproof vest nowadays? Ryan knew he should have aimed for the head. You shot me. Vamp protested in shock. You shot me. Begone, demon. Ryan raised his guns and fired at Will like a maniac. I know your game, succubus. Each of your freckles is a soul you stole. Vamp looked at Ryan as if he were mad, before fleeing behind a tree to avoid getting shot. Damn, this always happened when he tried to blow off stress. Richie, get your ass over here, she shouted. How can you resist my pheromones, asshole? Well, when you have taken as many mind-altering substances as I did, eventually you build a tolerance, Ryan replied, as he reloaded his guns. Frankly, I've tried much stronger aphrodisiacs than your pheromones. You wouldn't believe half the things I've done. No matter, the ginger devil replied from behind her cover, a kiss and your vitals will fail you. As she said that, all too familiar inhuman faces emerged from the woods to surround Ryan from all sides. Dear guest. Five vicious clowns, each armed with napkins and silver cutlery. The Monte Carlo is currently closed. Bring it, Pennywise, Ryan replied, shooting the closest one as it collapsed into a white substance. These illusions could harm him like the real ones, but they died like the originals too. They only had as much power as his mind gave them. As he engaged the clowns, Vamp left her hiding spot and moved around bushes like a stalking lion, her hands now letting out some kind of colored smoke. Lethal pheromones, most probably. Ryan briefly stopped time, the Monaco illusions vanishing instantly. However, unlike Bloodstream's ghost before, when time resumed, the clowns returned to life. Is that the best you've got, pajamas, he taunted Night Terror as he slaughtered his way through the clowns. I killed thousands of them. I even ate one. Then, as he was surrounded by darkness and dead clowns, a new smell filled the air. One that filled him with anxiety and dread. The stench of death and disease and... Riri. Ryan turned around, and faced her. She stood on the whetstone near the waterfall, wearing clothes drenched in blood. Shorty. Ryan asked, though intellectually, he knew this was all in his head. Len opened her mouth, only to vomit blood. She cried crimson tears while letting out an ear-piercing shriek, and charged at the courier with a knife raised. Ryan was so startled by the sight, that the illusion had closed the gap before he could aim. She used one arm to push him against a tree, and the other to try and stab him with a knife. The courier had to drop one of his guns to catch her hand and keep the blade away, he then attempted to aim with his remaining gun, even as his attacker started shocking him. You never left Monaco. The illusion's voice didn't belong to Len, but Ryan himself. You're still in that bed, and this is all a dying dream. That was probably the worst thing someone could have said to the time traveler, and it made him lose focus for an instant. Night Terror's blade instantly hit Ryan's thigh, though the courier managed to deviate the attack away from his vitals. Unfortunately, while the scary special effect failure kept him pinned to a tree, Vamp emerged from her hiding spot. You should have taken the easy way out, jackass, she told Ryan as her pheromone-charged hand moved towards his neck. At least I would have fucked you first. Maybe next time, Ryan replied with a scowl of pain, before freezing time. He expected the illusion to vanish, 
but instead, it merely transformed. From a nightmarish, twisted version of Len, to a masked man in a full black suit. There you are. Ryan pushed the paralyzed night terror away, and shot him twice in the head. When time resumed, the blue genome's corpse crashed against a surprised vamp and caused her to trip on the whetstones, nearly falling into the waterfall nearby. One hand on his thigh wound, Ryan raised his gun at her. Wait, the vamp pleaded while raising her hands in surrender, her scent filling Ryan with a mix of desire and regret. Don't kill me. I can make it worth your while. Yes, she would be his. His mind, his body screamed it at him. She would do everything Ryan wanted, he just had to drop his gun, and take her now. What's your name? The courier asked, pointing his gun at Night Terror's remains. His and yours? For later. Richard Pinkman, and Karen Ricci. She forced herself to smile. Yes, lower that gun, and I will kiss your wound. Ryan shot the ginger menace in the head before she could tempt him further. No sex before marriage, he quipped, as the waters dragged the assassin's bodies down the waterfall. My purity is my shield. Afterward, Ryan let out a sigh of pain, Night Terror's knife still embedded in his flesh. He couldn't remove it without risking bleeding out, even with his enhanced physiology. At least, not until he found a safe spot. However, he didn't have time for this. The courier heard an explosion in the distance, south of his location. It seemed Adam Cat was fighting for his life too, in spite of the time traveler's best efforts. Ryan could barely hear himself think, as his heartbeat rose in intensity. His heart felt as if it would burst in his chest, and his vision blurred at the edge. I'm impressed. Pluto. Ryan immediately raised his gun in the darkness, but couldn't locate her. Was she hiding behind a tree? Down the waterfall? No, the voice was a distant shout, far away. No one has survived against us so long before, at least not without backup. Pluto fell silent for a brief instant, while Ryan tried to locate her by sound. You are quick save, are you not? My niece asked us that no harm befall you a while ago. She asked me to spare you too, Ryan replied with a scowl. He couldn't hear right with that heartbeat drum in his head. You know, I've been meaning to ask, are you single? I'm widowed, she replied with a tone that made Ryan wonder if she was joking. Why? Either it was the lasting effects of the pheromones, Jasmine's absence in his life, or sheer masochism, but the courier couldn't help but be a relentless flirt. Can't we solve our differences the noble way, with an arranged marriage? I swear, I will be the best you ever had. I will pass, Pluto replied, all business. Your thought process is painfully transparent. Separating so I could only focus on one of you only. But Sparrow is giving chase to the traitor as we speak. Your scheme changed nothing. Don't you know cats eat sparrows? Ryan shook his head, on edge. No calamity had befallen him so far because Pluto wanted an audience, but he had no idea what would happen once she fully unleashed her power at this distance. You don't know anything about the animal kingdom. I have studied your marker from afar, and it seems strange. As if connected to a second one, far, far beyond my reach. A universe that my curse cannot touch. Her voice was getting closer. You're not really here, are you? You're just a projection. Even if my calamities kill you, you will pop up again. Honestly, I don't think the Earth would survive two of me. At least it meant that while Pluto could kill Ryan now and track him in future loops, she couldn't put the courier down permanently. The news came as a relief. Now, if only he could confirm the same with Cancel, that would be perfect. If you fight so ferociously to live, then there is a cost to pay, even if you can recover, the underboss said with sharp insight. Stay out of this, quick save. My brother wants his godson dead for his treachery. He doesn't care about you. Just, look the other way. Sorry, you're too poor to afford my rates. Then die. Pluto unleashed the full strength of her curse at him, and the world trembled. Literally. The ground quaked below his feet, and a terrible wind blew through the trees. Leaves flew in his direction, and before Ryan knew what hit him, they cut through his clothes and skin like razors. 
The gun in the courier's hands made a worrying sound, and branches fell on him at the speed of javelins. Ryan hurriedly froze time to dodge the projectiles and toss his gun away, just before the gunpowder inside caused it to explode mid-flight. I see how your power works, he heard Pluto taunting him as time resumed. You freeze time for a few seconds. Five? Maybe ten? You can gain a respite from my curse by breaking the flow of causality, but at this distance, you can't escape everything. At some point, you will slip up. Eventually, you will die. Everything dies. Ryan opened his mouth for a clever retort, only for something to catch him from behind. A noose-shaped branch from a tree grabbed his neck and raised him above the ground, tightening its hold. At the same time, Night Terror's knife moved on its own, worming its way through his flesh as if wielded by an invisible hand. At such a short distance, Pluto's curse outright warped reality. It caused the world itself to want Ryan dead. Worse, the courier heard a gunshot in the distance. Pluto had decided to speed his demise along the old-fashioned way. Hastily freezing time, Ryan managed to break the branch holding him prisoner, removed Night Terror's knife, and tossed it aside before it could worm its way to his vitals. As he moved, he noticed Pluto's bullet frozen in midair, its trajectory had clearly deviated to target the courier's head. Should he use the plushie? No, the risk was too great. If Pluto's power could affect it, then it might do worse than just turn against Ryan. No sooner did the courier step out of the way and time resumed, than he almost tripped and broke his skull against a large stone. His movements slowed down, his heart beating so fast his enhanced body couldn't keep up with the blood flow. Beep. Ryan heard a familiar sound coming from inside his suit. The A-bomb. Shit, shit, shit. Pluto's power prioritized killing him over collateral damage. Without any other choice, Ryan froze time, dragged the device out of his clothes, and hastily disabled it. Thankfully, the temporal anomaly cancelled the calamitous power and he managed to remove the detonator. However, when time resumed, he found himself without any defense. The ground collapsed beneath his feet, dragging him into the river and down the small waterfall. Ryan managed to protect his head with his arms before he hit a large stone below, but part of the natural structure collapsed behind him. A pile of rubble buried him from the chest down, crushing his legs. He only had the strength to raise his head, as a lone shadow loomed over him from atop the waterfall. This is as far as you go, quick save, Pluto said, raising a gun at him from the higher ground. The distance between them was no more than 15 meters now. I will tell my niece you did your best. I'll, Ryan rasped, the water level rising and threatening to drown him. Be, back. And I will kill you as many times as it takes. No, you won't. Both Pluto and Ryan turned their heads, Felix emerging from the woods with a weapon, charged with his explosive power. The Panda Doll from the Panda Mobile. Yes. Ryan thought, his lungs too squeezed by rubble to articulate his words. Use the power. Use the Panda power. Take this. Felix snarled, as he prepared to throw the projectile at a stoic Pluto. The courier felt the death curse's pressure vanish, as it targeted Felix next. A rain of branches and leaves hit the young hero from behind just as he tossed his projectile, two wood spears impaling him through the right leg and shoulder. Felix collapsed while the leaves hit the panda doll in midair, detonating it at a safe distance. Pluto could use her ability defensively. Where is Sparrow? Cruella asked calmly while dusting off her dress. Kitten's valiant effort had achieved exactly nothing. Dead, Felix said with a snarl of pain. The branch spears had pinned him to the ground, and his blood mixed with the water falling down the waterfall. Took her by surprise, and blasted her. Pluto's scowl deepened, and she aimed at Kitten's head with her gun. She was a loyal soldier, she said, taking a step in his direction. Felix coughed blood, as the curse intensified and attacked his vitals. Truly, my niece was too good for you. It couldn't end like this. This run, it had started so well, and he had made so much progress. Ryan was so close to breaking his own curse, to solve the secret of carrying someone across loops. It couldn't end like this, not after everything. God answered his silent prayer with a meowing sound. 
Pluto stopped before she could fire a bullet, as a white furball hopped out of the forest and right in front of Felix. The animal sat right in front of Adam Kitten, and looked at Pluto with its adorable eyes. Eugene Henry. What is, Pluto's expression had changed from bored professionalism to a hint of fear. No more wooden spears or leaves fell to finish her prey off. In fact, strands of yellow energy seemed to flicker around the area, as if something challenged the underboss power. What is this thing? And someone had followed the cat through the wood. A striking young woman with hair as bright as the sun, the most elegant costume, and a gold-plated gun. Fortuna. Of all people, it was Fortuna who came to the rescue. A living good luck charm. Even better, her power seemed to interfere enough with Pluto's that no calamity or heart attack finished her brother off. Instead, a golden cloud surrounded Fortuna like a halo, and shielded Felix thanks to the physical proximity. Godmother, she said with a frown, before noticing her brother and immediately rushing to his side. Felix. Felix are you alright? Fortuna. Pluto frowned deeply, her gun still pointed at Felix. You were to stay with Livia. I. I tried to follow, Fortuna's eyes noticed Ryan down the waterfall, and widened in shock. Ryan. The courier tried to wave a hand at her, but his body failed. Now that Pluto's death curse didn't target him, the water level had fallen and no longer threatened to drown him, but his body remained crushed, battered, and bleeding. He was in no shape to interfere. Fortuna's horrified eyes moved from Ryan to Felix, as she quickly put the two and two together. No. Your parents gave their authorization, Pluto said, almost reading Lucky Girl's mind. The task fell on me, specifically so you wouldn't have to sully your hands. But, Fortuna's voice broke in her throat, as she tried to form a coherent sentence. It can't be. He betrayed the organization to the carnival, Pluto insisted, growing annoyed with Felix's continued survival. Now move out of my way. It has to be done. Fortuna's panic turned into a scowl, as she silently reached a decision. Godmother. Fortuna raised her own gun at Pluto's head, while stepping between the killer and Felix. Get away from my brother. If she wasn't such an annoyance, Ryan might have fallen for her on the spot. You're turning traitor too. Pluto glared at the siblings. You disgrace your parents, both of you. Get away from my brother. Fortuna repeated, her fingers trembling on the trigger. I'm. I won't hesitate. The two women exchanged a glare, the tension rising between them. Fortuna, no, Felix pleaded, his eyes widening in dread. No, don't. Spare the rod, Pluto said, calmly aiming her weapon at Fortuna while the death curse found a new target. Yellow strands surrounded Fortuna's cloud, like spears ready to fall on a shield. Spoil the child. Two gunshots echoed across the forest, and then silence. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to The Perfect Run. Chapter 69, Limited Time Ryan's vision blurred. It was hard to focus, darkness lurked at the edge of his vision, and his strength left him. He couldn't even feel his legs, and his whole body felt cold. Maybe it was the loss of blood, or the leftover damage he suffered from the battle with Pluto. Or perhaps it was Eugene Henry's doing, as the cat teleported right in front of Ryan. The feline looked down on the trapped genome without a sound, like a guide to the underworld. Fortuna. Above the waterfall, a horrified Adam cat held his sister in his arms, blood flowing from her chest. Pluto's corpse fell down the waterfall, a hole in her forehead. The river pulled the underboss downstream to her last abode, her curse had been cancelled and the woods returned to normal, though it came with a cost. Fortuna had made a lucky shot but even luck couldn't cheat death from her due. Fortuna. Felix shouted, trying to cover his sister's wound with his hand and prevent her from bleeding out. Ryan knew enough about medicine to know it was useless. If he had the tools and the energy, he might have saved her. He would save her still. He would save them all the next time around. In the end, only Ryan was cursed with immortality. Only he could carry that burden. As he started to lose consciousness, Ryan noticed a metal shadow moving upstream. 
a mermaid in power armor crossing the river to rescue him. Riri! Len shouted in horror while rushing at his side, immediately pushing away the debris keeping him down. I'm here. I'm here. Len. Always there to save him when all was lost. I must go now. For a moment, the courier thought he had spoken out loud, until he realized where the disembodied voice came from. Something spoke through Eugene Henry, using Ryan's own voice. The rest, the cat looked into the courier's eyes, his feline gaze shining purple with the wisdom of the stars, is up to you. A flash of violet light overwhelmed Ryan, and he lost consciousness. When Ryan opened his eyes, it was to the tune of the International. The ceiling was crimson red, and he faced a portrait of Marx and Engel. An intravenous device pumped his right arm with anesthesia, right next to a steampunk wheelchair of leather and tin. Damn it, had he woken in a hidden Soviet lab again? Once had been enough. Ryan's eyes wandered around himself, his body feeling heavy, he had trouble breathing correctly, and his chest itched. Most importantly, he couldn't feel anything below his waist, including his most dangerous weapon. Even Vamp died in an attempt to claim it for herself. He was in a hospital bed, with a TV and a window leading into a dark undersea abyss. Sitting on a chair right in front of him, little Sarah read Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. She hadn't noticed him waking up. Ryan turned his head, glancing at another bed near his own. Adam Cat laid half-hidden beneath the bed sheet, watching the ceiling with empty eyes. Bandages covered his torso, and he had an intravenous system of his own. Felix. Ryan's voice startled Sarah, who hastily closed her book. Kitten? Nothing. Adam Cat didn't even respond. His gaze was a blank, empty abyss of nothingness, a thousand-yard stare. He has been like that since Ma brought you in, little Sarah said with a frown. He doesn't respond when people call him. I've seen that gaze before in Rust Town. He's broken inside, and he's not coming back. He will. Ryan knew that from experience. Eventually, when it's done chewing on you, the abyss spits you back. Of course, the courier would probably turn back time before Adam Cat finished that healing process. Even if she annoyed him, he couldn't let Fortuna stay dead. Not after she gave her life to save her brother. Now you're awake, get your ass out of bed, little Sarah said, before realizing the obvious. Figuratively, I mean. How do you feel? Without my legs, like Christopher Reeves. I don't know who that is. And that's why I can't stand you. At least I still have Lou, little Sarah suddenly stopped, as she put the two and two together. Oh wait, I get the joke. Can't stand. Now, if you can bring me the wheelchair, Ryan said, glancing at his new Plymouth Fury. I will let you push me around a bit, but please don't talk behind my back. Do you want me to find you a parking lot? Little Sarah replied, as she put her book aside and helped Ryan get into the wheelchair. As he expected, the rest of the courier's body hadn't been spared either. He had almost as many bandages as an Egyptian mummy. It's a start, but you need training in Pun Fu, Ryan said. How long was I out? Ma brought you in yesterday night, she replied, grabbing the pole holding the intravenous system and attaching it to the wheelchair. The other orphans made bets about your death. Most said you wouldn't make it. I hope you bet on me. If he could trust her smile, she did. Yeah, you're too mean to die, and Ma, it would have hurt Ma, if you didn't wake up. Sarah glared at the courier. She was in tears when she brought you here. I didn't plan on it, Ryan said with a sigh. Can you bring me to her? Sure. Sarah pushed the wheelchair towards the hospital's door, while Ryan sent one last glance to Adam Cat. Felix had stopped looking at the ceiling, and now glanced at the undersea abyss outside the habitat with a blank face. Ryan couldn't blame him. His own parents had signed his death warrant, and a sister he left behind died for him. It would shake anyone. Felix. I don't want to talk, Kitten said suddenly, his voice emotionless. Now wasn't the time. Maybe never. Sarah pushed the wheelchair through a steel corridor, and eventually, to Len's workshop. Ryan found his best friend tinkering on her diving armor, 
which she had linked to the Krona radio and Dynami's brain tech with cables. Some of the suit's parts had been replaced with copies of Jasmine's design, including the helmet. It seemed Len had decided to repurpose her existing equipment rather than make something new, perhaps due to lack of resources. And Eugene Henry stood atop a server, like a sphinx. Riri, the sheer relief on Len's face was almost palpable. You've woken up. Did you ever doubt, he joked. When the genius winced, Ryan realized he should have kept his mouth shut. Yes, I did, she said with a frown. For the first time, he noticed the red shade around Len's eyes, as if she had repeatedly wiped away tears. I thought. I thought I was too late. You're an ass, Sarah told Ryan with a glare. I would kick you in the leg, if it wasn't useless. You can still pinch me in the arm if you want, Ryan replied, and she did. Ouch. You deserve worse, Sarah said, before looking at Len with concern. Ma, you should rest. I can bring you a warm hot chocolate. No, it's okay. Thanks, sweetie. Len forced herself to smile at Sarah. Can you, leave us for a moment? I'm sorry, Ryan said immediately. Len looked away. I couldn't save her. The girl. She was already drowning in her own blood when, when I. She was dead before you even arrived. Ryan moved the wheelchair forward, putting a hand on Len's arm. To his surprise, she didn't immediately back away from the physical contact. Shorty, it's not your fault. She pushed his hand away. If I had arrived earlier. You would have died, Ryan said. Who told you where we were? I, her expression turned from saddened to embarrassed. I hacked your phone. After you turned it off, I had to search for you on foot. He should be mad at her for this, but the NSA did it first. Ryan glanced at the device, and then at Eugene Henry. The cat seemed delighted to see his master again, but his gaze had returned to its natural blue. Did you finish the consciousness transfer device? I think so, Len declared with a frown. But it's gone. What's gone? Ryan asked with a frown. Your cat's energy readings. They're gone. He's a normal cat now. Len shook her head, while Eugene Henry showed them his royal ass. Whatever caused his teleportation jumps before, it stopped. A purple world entity had possessed Eugene Henry like the plushie, and then left the building. Why? Why did it act this way? What was the point? Ryan couldn't figure it out, but he would in time. How are things on the surface? Len instantly winced. Clearly, things had only changed for the worse. Riri, you really want to know? You just woke up. Yes, I want to. Len slowly moved towards a computer hooked to the servers, typed on the keyboard, and showed him the screen. Droplets covered the camera recording the image, so Ryan assumed it came from a sea-based probe. But the quality was enough for the courier to see the disaster in all its glory. An awfully familiar disaster. New Rome had turned into a war zone, with Augusti genomes and Dynami's forces openly warring in the streets. The private security's helicopters rained bullets on superpowered gangsters, who retaliated with fireballs. Flames consumed buildings, including the IL Miglior HQ, which Vulcan and an armored squadron bombarded with missiles. A horde of cybernetically enhanced dinosaurs soon emerged from the Dynami's tower, engaging the attackers in melee. The led the charge. Wyvern had been pinned to a building by countless spears and sharp weapons, while Mars dueled a colossal plant monster over the rooftops. Spatial tears opened around the Centurion wannabe, raining swords and spears upon the vegetal abomination. Yet the creature retaliated with vines as thick as trucks and pollen capable of melting steel. As Wyvern freed herself, Mars jumped from one rooftop to the other by materializing shields beneath his feet to escape her. The strip had been flooded by a tidal wave, and corpses washed up on an artificial shore, only to rise up again to attack Dynami's facilities. Neptune himself rampaged across Rust Town, having shaped an astronomical quantity of water into the shape of a colossal squid. A living laser cut one of its tentacles, and was soon joined by devilry. 
But in spite of their best efforts, the liquid elemental quickly pulled itself back together and continued its deadly march towards the junkyard. The villa atop Mount Augustus had transformed into a fuming crater, over which two lights dueled to the death, a raging sun, and a crimson lightning bolt. Their fight was by far the most fearsome, both moving so fast even the camera had troubles following them. Mighty thunderbolts and plasma blasts rained down from the heavens, devastating the district around the mountain. The camera provided a panoramic view of the disaster, eventually reaching the harbor. Mortimer, Lanka, and other genomes fired at will against an unseen form, which almost gave Ryan a headache simply showing up on screen. A horrifying eldritch mascot with swirling tentacles for a beard, great dark wings, and webbed hands, a terrifying mix between a squid and a human, worn by a foolish genome unable to control its public domain-powered darkness. The abomination let out a scream, whose garbled words Ryan's maddened mind managed to understand. Cthulhu Fdain. Wardrobe had brought out the apocalypse suit. Things were that bad. It's, it's like that all over the coast, Len admitted, as she sank in a chair of her own. Not just New Rome. Sicily and Sardinia too. It was the end of the last loop, all over again. Destroying the meta had only delayed the inevitable. So long as events remained on their current track, Dynamis, the Carnival, and the Augusti were bound to collide with disastrous results. His perfect run looked so far away still. I'm sorry Shorty, but Lab 66 will be for next time. Yeah, she replied with a frown. It was like this? The previous time? Not as terrible, but the result is the same. Adam just provided a bigger MATC, the computer let out a bleep. What is it? A call, Len said, frowning as she typed on the keyboard. Vulcan. Ryan's heart skipped a beat. Was this a ray of hope, in the middle of another bad ending? Open the channel. The picture on the screen changed from New Rome's apocalyptic landscape, to a young woman sitting in a chair. But it wasn't Jasmine. Ryan, Livia said with relief, as her visage appeared on the screen. Thank goodness, since I couldn't see you, I... I wasn't sure. Len's face turned into a scowl, while Ryan took it in stride. If I were dead, princess, this horrible present would have ended abruptly. True, but I worried that perhaps, you hadn't told me the entire truth, Livia replied with a joyless smile, before it broke off completely. Fortuna, is she? Dead, Ryan admitted, causing Livia's expression to deaden into deep grief. Felix is alive, but deeply shaken. Livia fell entirely silent, her expression dead, her eyes looking down. I... I foresaw it, she muttered to herself, holding back tears, but I hoped. I hoped I, is my aunt. Fortuna died defending her brother from Pluto, and if she had her way, your late aunt would have killed Felix too. Though it was blunt, Ryan thought she needed to hear the grim truth right now. Your father gave the order, and Pluto didn't think twice about carrying it out. I never wanted this, she said, joining her fingers. I never. I never thought it would come to this. Even Len's expression changed to sympathy, even if she clearly disliked Livia, perhaps because she empathized with the Mafia princess situation. Ryan sighed. I will make it all right, he said, his tone softening. I will make it right again. Livia finally looked up. Is there truly no other way, she asked, her tone breaking. Nobody will remember. Nobody but you. If nobody else remembers, if nobody remembers, it will happen again. Ryan glanced at Len, who shook her head. She had guessed his thoughts, and disagreed with the idea. Livia was sharp enough to catch on to their unease. You have a plan to solve this issue, she guessed. We can't tell you, Len said before Ryan could open his mouth. We. I'm sorry, but no. You are the underdiver, correct? Len Sabino. Livia regained her composure as she focused on Shorty, putting on her poker face. Perhaps she had started using her power to observe and predict the genius. You know everything. Yes, Len admitted. Anne. I was against him telling you. I understand why you distrust me, especially after, after what my aunt did. 
Livia's fingers fidgeted, the young woman unable to hide her shame. But I swear, I never wanted this to happen. I did everything I could to stop it. Len wasn't impressed much. But you couldn't. No. No, I couldn't. Livia closed her eyes and bit her lips. The little gesture reminded Ryan of Len, so very much. My father, he usually listens to me. But not on this. No argument, in any possibility I've seen, could cause him to reconsider. His hatred of Hargraves runs too deep. Where are you even? Len asked with a frown. How can we be sure that others aren't listening? I am in a safe place outside New Rome alongside Narcinia. It's a private line, I assure you. Vulcan's private line, and she is too busy to listen. Livia cleared her throat. It's, it's precisely because she is too busy that I call you now. How did you know, how did you know Ryan was here? Len continued. You said your power didn't work on him. It doesn't, but I can still see the results of his actions afterward. I looked for a possibility where I could talk to Felix, and it always involved using this line. I don't even know where you are. Ryan cleared his throat. Shorty, I think that's enough. We're going nowhere with this. But Len would hear nothing of it. She told you she could talk her father out of, out of doing stupid things. She couldn't. What if she slips up about us to Augustus? Riri, she is a bomb. I was wrong, all right. Livia's outburst startled everyone. I was wrong, the Augusti princess said, her expression twisting into a mix of remorse, grief, and disappointment. I wanted to think dad. I wanted dad not to be capable of such destruction. But I was wrong. Even Narcinia. You shouldn't have trusted Augustus, Len said. It was written on the walls. Didn't you trust your own parents? Livia asked bitterly. When your parents told you something, did you distrust everything they said? Len flinched as if she had been slapped. That remark hit too close to home. Look. Livia let out a long, heavy breath. If there is any chance to right these wrongs, I want to help in any way I can. My family caused so much pain, and now it's up to you to make up for them. Now I understand the burden on your shoulders, Ryan. I. I'm not blind. I can see your wounds. After what you sacrificed to help me and Felix, I want to return the favor. I told you on the phone. You did not help an ingrate. So you finally believe me? About how we weren't enemies? Ryan asked, Livia answering with a nod. Took some trying. I know maybe it's too late, but... I was just scared, all right. Livia looked at the courier. I was scared of you. You're just, you're terrifying, Ryan. You know so much, but you can erase everything we do at will. You've done so countless times. None of my powers work on you. They work on father, but not on you. When you put it that way. Ryan said nothing, turning instead towards a silent Len. The courier could have forced the issue, but Shorty had been at his side through thick and thin. If she didn't trust Livia enough to involve her in their scheme, then he would have to respect her wish. Even if he didn't like it. In the end, Len's dilemma was the same as Ryan when he confided in Jasmine during the previous loop. To risk opening up, to risk betrayal and disappointment, for an uncertain future. To dare say something, and never take it back. We are, Len hesitated, but finally spoke up. We're trying to develop a system capable of sending someone's consciousness back in time. Truly. A streak of hope appeared on Livia's face. How can I help? Can I help? I have created a memory map of myself, Len admitted. It will transmit my memories to my previous self. But my system. I can't send more than one person back in time. At least not yet. I'm not even sure. I'm not even sure it will work at all. I modified one of my armors based on Ryan's design, but, there's no backup. No way to be sure it will work. You have one, Livia said immediately, eager at the idea of contributing. Her guilt ate her up like a festering wound. I may not retain my memories, but I keep a detailed journal. 
I could save information and transmit it to Ryan in the next iteration. I could record your machine's design. No, Len protested, still too suspicious of the Augusti princess to give up something that valuable. No, not the machine. Never the machine. The memory map then, Livia proposed calmly. Ryan's heart skipped a beat. You could record that. It's all data, is it not? Lines of code? Len answered Livia's question with a cautious nod. Then I can take a snapshot. If the transfer fails, you will have a backup. The genius then turned to the courier, looking into his eyes. It would be far less risky than providing the blueprints, since the brain map was an enormous mass of incomprehensible data without the original machine or Len's own technology, but it meant Livia could keep Shorty's memories hostage. Riri? After a short moment, Ryan answered with a nod. In the best case scenario, it wouldn't cost them anything, and in the worst case, in the worst case, it could make all the difference. He wanted to trust Livia. The courier wanted to think that for once, he could rely on someone on the other side of time. That he wouldn't be alone when he started again. Thank you. Both of you. Livia made a deep, formal bow. I swear, I will not disappoint you. When will you turn back time? I suppose it will happen as soon as I send Shorty's consciousness backward? Ryan asked, glancing at his friend. Yes, Len answered with a nod. My system should cause an, an early end, as the message is sent. A polite way to say it would kill Ryan. Is, Livia cleared her throat, trying to find her words. Is it possible I speak to Felix beforehand? I will link your feed to his TV, Len said. And send you the memory map too. Thank you, Livia said with a sad smile. Thank you. Len cut the conversation short, the screen turning black. You don't like it, Ryan said. No, Riri. No, I do not. If it goes wrong, she will have my life in her hands. If I fail, I... I will be her hostage, and she may use me against you. Do you understand that, Riri? I do. He narrowed his eyebrows. But why did you tell her, if you don't trust her? Because I trust you, Riri, Len replied. Anne. I was afraid of you too once. But I was wrong. Thanks, Shorty. Damn, he had sand in his eyes. If the world is just, you will remember these words. It's not, she said, looking away. But. I hope I'm wrong. The courier glanced at his cat, who now rested on the server. It said it was all up to us now, Ryan said. It helped, but now, it's all up to us. I. I don't understand. Eugene Henry. It said it had to go, and that the rest was all up to me now. Now, Ryan saw it clearly. The entity had sent Krona radio messages to encourage the courier as he considered giving up, caused him to meet with Livia early in the run, and subtly provided help to Len. Positioning Fortuna so that she would save Ryan's life, and indirectly convince Livia to assist. It set events in motion so this very meeting could happen. It would mean, it would mean that it sent Fortuna to her death intentionally, Len pointed out, skeptical. Should we trust something using human life so carelessly? I just want to see the best in people. Even in interdimensional horrors, without prejudice. Len wasn't convinced. Sometimes, there's no good part. Some people are rotten to the core. Yeah, I met Big Fat Adam, Ryan replied with a shrug. But I still want to see the best. Look for the stars in the night sky. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to The Perfect Run. Chapter 70, Gotcha. Sometimes, Ryan wondered if fate existed. He had seen it across many loops. While they didn't exactly repeat, events often echoed one another even after he interfered. Though the circumstances were wildly different, this loop would end similarly to the previous one, with new Rome burning, Ryan trapped in a suit of mechanical armor, and a genius trying to transfer her consciousness through time. It made sense. Ryan was only one person at the end of the day, a stone thrown into a river, until he mastered a loop enough to maximize his impact and send it off the rails, the sequence of events was tempted to reassert itself. 
The courier literally fought against the whole universe, and the rule of causality. But even if it cost him a great many things, Ryan always prevailed in the end. He never gave up on his hope that things would be different, because each loop was a little better than the previous one. His life was a process, each iteration optimizing the final run. And if the courier succeeded in ferrying more people across time, he could do more than just throw pebbles in the river. He could throw it off course with a landslide. I will need you to activate your power when I ask, Len said, as she put the modified armor's helmet on Ryan's face and hooked the courier to her machinery. From what I gathered, the violet flux should build up, reach critical mass before, before you approach the 10 seconds mark. Good, I would rather avoid making a new save point. Ryan looked through the helmet's lens, though no data showed up on them. Unlike Jasmine's armor, Len's design was cruder, experimental. It would serve as a fulcrum for his power, but her computer would run the actual computations. So, how should it go? I will send the memory map to my, my previous self. Len sat behind her computer. My current memory should overwrite the old ones. Hopefully. Maybe. It will work, Ryan said, both for her sake and his own. It has to. Everything is in place for it to work. We can't be sure, Len shook her head. I. I hope it will work, Riri. But I can't promise anything. The workshop's door opened, interrupting the discussion. A bandaged Felix walked inside the room, his gaze switching from Len to Ryan. The courier could see the disbelief in his eyes, and then the quiet acceptance. He had been standing behind the door for a while. How long, how long have you been listening? Len asked with a worried frown. Long enough, Felix replied as he sat on a workbench in front of Ryan. Nice armor, but I prefer the cashmere suit. One day, I'll make a cashmere power armor, Ryan joked. I guess you've got all the time in the world needed, when you can turn it back. Felix marked a short pause, his eyes focusing on his former teammate. Time travel. It's crazy, but it explains a great many things. How long have you been at it? How far can you go? Honestly, I don't know how old I am, Ryan admitted, before remembering one of his early encounters with Pluto. Between 500 and 1000, give it or take. As for how far I can turn the clock, right before my arrival in New Rome. You've been at this for almost a millennia. Felix shook his head in disbelief. That's crazy. Did, did Livia tell you? Len asked with a frown. No, but I was starting to wonder. When you've eliminated the impossible, what remains must be the truth, no matter how improbable. Felix shook his head. I stayed around wardrobe for too long. You've made peace with Livia? Ryan asked. It was one of the hopes he set for himself during his loop, and it would probably carry over to his perfect run. I wouldn't go so far, but... I think she understands why I left now. It took a war, but her faith in her father is finally shaken. Still too little, too late. Felix clenched his fists. You can save my sister? Yes, Ryan said. I will. Thanks. The hero let out a sigh of relief, but his face remained full of concern. Can't you bring me in for the ride too? You'll need help. No, sorry, Ryan said. The machine could only host one brain map. Believe me, I would if I could. We're, Len cleared her throat. We're not even sure I can make it at all. Felix took it well, all things considered. Or more likely, all that he went through lately had numbed his emotional reaction. I see. And once you go back, we all die. You will forget, Ryan reassured him. Like amnesia. Amnesia. I suppose that's one way to see it. Did, Adam Kitten's eyes squinted at Ryan. Did you fuck me before? No, Ryan replied, much to his kitten's disbelief. Of all things, that was the bit he worried about. I have a whole, fuck, marry, kill, list to fulfill before my perfect run. Marry Jamie, marry Yuki, fuck the vamp, kill PSYPSY. Len rolled her eyes, while Adam Cat crossed his arms. I don't know why I'm not even surprised, he said, before falling silent. 
Clearly, he had a lot to process. Kitten? I didn't understand how much she loved me, Felix said, looking at the floor. Fortuna. I thought she would choose our parents over me, but I was wrong. I was wrong about her, and about Livia too. There's still hope for them. I. I never appreciated my sister, Ryan. I see that now. My own parents signed off my death warrant, but Fortuna, she chose me over them. When her back was against the wall, she did the right thing. Neither Ryan nor Len said anything. Both understood that the hero spoke with his heart, and needed to get a truth off his chest. And when you turn back time, Ryan, I'll forget that. I'll be angry and bitter at her, all over again. Her death will mean nothing. No, because I will remember, Ryan reassured Felix. His opinion of Lucky Girl hadn't been the best, but after seeing her sacrifice, it had greatly improved. She would make it through his perfect run, one way or another. Can I ask a favor, Quickie? Make sure I, Adam Cat gathered his breath. Make sure I understand that by the time you're done, and without her dying. I. I don't think I will ever make up with Fortuna, if you don't interfere. Don't worry, I'll find a way. Most likely, he would kidnap them both and bring them to family therapy. Even if he had to turn one of them into a pickle. Thanks. A genuine smile spread on Felix's face. I had fun working with you, Ryan. You're a good friend. Damn it, Shorty, you should start the process before I die of diabetes. Ryan looked away from Felix, as his genius friend typed on her keyboard. We never got around to doing a training montage with the panda. Yeah, I'll carry that regret to my grave, Felix mused. Would have been fun. A terrible alarm echoed through the underwater base, interrupting the happy moment. Ryan turned his head at Len, his heavy helmet slowly moving with his skull. A picture of the abyss outside appeared on her computer screen, alongside the shape of an enormous submarine. Projectors from Len's base cast light on its hull, and the logo painted on its steel shell. Dynamis. The computer bleeped, as someone tried to establish contact. Len cautiously answered with a frown, a new video feed forming on the screen. A ghoulish, shining skull looked at the genomes in the workshop. So you lived, Adam Cat. There was no relief in Alphonse Manada's voice, only a hint of curiosity. I was wondering where you had run off to. Fallout? Felix said as he climbed down from the workbench and approached Len's computer. What is the meaning of this? Aren't you in New Rome? I was, but we are moving our HQ and laboratories out of the city. Augustus destroyed our previous installations. The Dynami CEO glanced at Len. And we will pick up Miss Sabino along the way. Len bristled in dread, much to Ryan's frustration. ET2, Nagasaki, he taunted the nuclear cyborg. Is that you inside that armor, quick save? Fallout replied with a scoff. Good, you're coming too. I will give you 10 minutes to get out of this underwater hole and join us on board our submarine. We are on a tight schedule, and Vulcan might give pursuit soon. No, Len protested, shaking her head. We politely deny your request, Ryan said. Don't force us to raise a new Berlin Wall. I don't think you understand. Alphonse focused on Len, his shining gaze without emotion. We need her, dead or alive. If you don't surrender now, will flood this entire complex and harvest the corpse's genetic material. Shorty's face lost all color. There are children inside. We helped you against the meta, Ryan pointed out, deciding to add this man to his kill list. You have an odd view of long-term partnerships. I knew of your dealings with Livia Augusti, quick save. You betrayed us first. Alphonse grunted, ignoring Len's comment. It doesn't matter. If you want to spare lives, you'll join us. Felix didn't hide his fury and disappointment. I thought you were one of the good ones. I am. Augustus will never be the face of Europe, so long as I live. All I do is to make sure he and his twisted kind don't win. How are you any different? Felix snarled angrily. You heard Hargraves. Augustus murdered an entire peaceful community to get his hands on my sister Narcinia. 
And now, you threaten the lives of children to put a genius under your yoke. The difference is that I do it to save human lives, not destroy them. Can you even fathom how many people Augustus slew? How many more he will kill, now that he has let go of whatever breaks he had? Alphonse turned to look at Len. The faster we end this war, the less people will die. If she comes with us, we will be one step closer to victory. Why me? Len asked, her voice breaking. What? What did I do to you? Is this about the factory? What point is there in telling you now? Alphonse replied gruffly, but did shed some light on his motives. You are the key to refining our elixir processing, Sabino. To mass produce these potions, so they're no longer a tool of oppression by the few. You want to make everyone a genome, Ryan realized. Yes. Augustus and warlords like him are able to exert so much influence because they concentrate genomes into their organizations. But if everyone is powerful, then no one is. Don't you get it? The only way to break these superpowered dictatorships is to democratize elixirs. And Sabino is the key to fulfilling this dream. He was a red in more than one way. A shame, if he didn't want to carve her open, fall out and Shorty would have probably gotten along perfectly. Because you keep bloodstream in your labs? Ryan asked, Len bristling at his bluntness. Fallout ignored them, denying them even information for the next loop. I tire of this nonsense. What will it be? Dead, or alive? Len looked at Ryan, and her answer came swiftly. Better dead than Corpo, the genius said, as she abruptly cut off the communication. Alphonse immediately answered this act of defiance with a bombardment, the entire undersea complex shaking as projectiles hit the habitat. Now, Riri. Len ordered, as she booted her program. Ryan immediately froze time, violet flux particles floating out of his suit. As they grew in number, the courier took a moment to observe the scene around him one last time. Water breaking through the ceiling thanks to Dynami's torpedoes, Len, looking at her screen with dread and hope, and Felix, who waited for the end with quiet dignity. It wasn't the ending Ryan had hoped for, and he swore it would not happen again. Violet particles swallowed the world around him, and this loop came to an end. It was May 8, 2020 in New Rome. Not for the first time, and not for the last. At least he could feel his legs again. Instead of driving straight into the city, Ryan parked his car nearby and waited. Music came out of the chrono radio, instead of a message from an erased timeline. Much like Eugene Henry, whatever force had influenced the device during the previous loop had stopped doing so. It was all up to Ryan now. The courier didn't say a word, didn't move an inch. Dread overtook his body, as he desperately waited for a sign from Len. Any sign that she had made it through. Any sign that Jasmine's loss and all the sacrifices afterward had meant something. Ryan had never believed in any god, but right now, he was sorely tempted to pray. The Chrono Radio's music stopped abruptly, and her voice came out. Riri. Ryan's heart skipped a beat, as a wave of intense relief overtook him. Shorty, he asked, his fingers fidgeting around the driving wheel. Do you, do you remember? A short silence followed, and then came the moment of truth. The two words Ryan had hoped to hear one day, since he first gained his power. I do. It worked. It worked. It worked. After so many trials, so many false starts, so much loneliness and pain, Ryan's patience had finally paid off. He had spent countless loops researching his power and accumulating the necessary knowledge, and many more gathering the tools needed to pull it off. This quest had needed contributions from Len, from Jasmine, and so many others, but it had finally reached its final stage. This time was different. Things had changed, and they would never be the same. There wasn't a word in any human language to describe Ryan's joy. A centuries-old curse had finally been broken, and he would no longer be alone before eternity. Riri, Len said with a cough, and he could sense something wrong in her tone. You must go to the orphanage. Now. Right now? Ryan blinked, his relief overwhelmed by concern. But Ghoul will kill. You must come quickly, Len interrupted him, her cough getting worse. 
There's little time. The procedure, there's a problem, and I'm feeling. I'm not feeling right. Forget ghoul, I. I need your help right now. Or it will all be for nothing. Shorty, what do you mean? Silence. She had cut the communication. Shorty. Ryan smashed the accelerator, and immediately drove to Rust Town. Though the idea of letting Ghoul get away with murder annoyed the courier, even if it wouldn't be permanent, he shut off his conscience. Len needed him. Asked for help. And she remembered. It worked, Ryan muttered to himself, as he drove north. He couldn't believe it. It worked. Len's idea had worked. Maybe it had come with a health cost or side effects, but it had worked. He was so overjoyed, so hopeful, that he threw money at the private security so they would let him pass through the Rust Town border. It didn't matter if the consciousness transfer had side effects, the fact it worked at all meant it could be perfected. The future was bright and hopeful. Ryan's phone rang as he came within sight of the orphanage. His cell phone didn't recognize the number, but the courier did. Livia. She had kept her word, but Ryan didn't answer yet. Len was waiting for him in front of the orphanage's doors, all alone. She wore her jumpsuit and carried her water rifle, her eyes sullen and her face pale. More worryingly, blood dripped from her nose. Shorty. Ryan hastily parked his Plymouth Fury, stepped out of the car, and immediately rushed at his friend's side. Shorty, are you alright? His best friend looked at him without a word, clearly sick. Did the transfer damage her brain? Shorty, I'm here, Ryan said, approaching her. It's going to be alright, ISW. She shot him. If it had been anyone else, he would have dodged. If it had been anyone but Len, the courier would have frozen time and moved out of the way. But his mind, his mind simply couldn't imagine Shorty raising her weapon at him, and pulling the trigger. Ryan froze in place for a split second, and it was all it took. Before he knew what happened, a sphere of water formed around the courier and immediately absorbed him. An intense pressure restrained his body, and liquid broke into his mask. Why? Ryan held his breath, utterly shocked, as his friend observed him from the other side of the watery prison. And as he looked into her cold, soulless eyes, he realized something had gone terribly wrong. Len came back through time all right. But someone else hitched a ride. Please subscribe to A7 English Podcasts and enjoy listening every day with us. Thank you.